Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Okay. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, Mr. Donahue, Professor Donahue. Either way. Are you ready to proceed? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, as a preliminary matter, may mm -hmm. I raise a couple issues? Sure. Uh, we would like to object on a couple lines of questioning for which uh, Harvard is offering Dr. Donahue. Uh, we don't feel he's established qualifications for certain lines of testimony, mainly on two issues, his qualifications to testify about, testify about the political tensions in Concord and Carlisle during 25 years or so of separation. Now, I'll elaborate a little bit in more detail. The other issue that we object to his testimony as an expert is testifying about chains of title uh, and layouts, um, which we think require the certification, technical skills and training of a land surveyor. Uh, he's done general history on land holding mm -hmm. patterns and land use, but his ability to testify on the, those technical issues uh, of how to read deeds, how to reconcile inconsistencies, how descriptions of land to, uh, change over time, uh, Etc., Your Honor, and how to make, how to interpret calls and layouts uh, and, and the like. Um, we don't think that he has been um, qualified to uh, answer that kind of, or respond to that kind of questioning from, from Harvard and the other defendants. On the political tensions, which they offer as uh, somehow background to the layout, uh, as well as aftermath of the layout, including, you know, uh, going through four um, alphabet, uh, of alphabetical tabs of exhibits from 1750s to 1780 and later, uh, voluminous records, Your Honor, which apparently are to talk to this political tension uh, leaving aside our objection to their relevance, uh, he, Mr. Dr. Donahue has been qualified as an environmental historian, which is a branch of history. Um, he has not been qualified as a historian of a political historian of political history or social history or cultural history. His expertise is in land use in, I think he described the agroecological system of the East Quarter of Concord in the Great Meadow. Mm -hmm. uh, we have no objection to his testimony about land holding patterns and land use generally uh, based on that expertise. But the political tensions uh, of Carlisle and Concord over that long period of time, which I believe he said he would rely principally on uh, Bob Gross's um, publication book about the Minutemen is not competent uh, for him to testify to. So we'd raise those two objections, Your Honor, to his, to, the, to what Harvard is proposing him for testifying um, and, and ask your uh, honor to limit that line of questioning based on his lack of expertise. Okay, I had kind of anticipated that you would have an objection along these lines, Mr. Bat. Um, as Mr. Professor Donahue was not identified as an expert until the, I believe, until the supplemental um, joint pretrial memorandum submitted by Harvard, which is fairly 
recently, um, May 26. Uh, Ms. Ms. King, I'll give you a second. I'll give you a chance in a second. Um, uh, I, I understand why we didn't have a chance to consider this issue in the form of a motion in limine. Um, my inclination is to uh, just take it step by step, see what kind of foundation gets laid before Professor Donahue offers an opinion on any particular subject. And I'll expect you to raise an objection and I'll rule at that time. Ms. King, do you wish to add to anything? Um, just some context, both procedurally, Your Honor, and also um, to respond to a few points that Mr. Bat made, if that's um, amenable to you, Your Honor. Okay. So um, first, procedurally, I just want to um, clarify as to the disclosure of Dr. Donahue. As you know, Your Honor, Harvard was brought back into this case late in the game, and we endeavored as soon as possible to serve discovery on the town, um, seeking these questions, or answers to some of Harvard's questions as it relates to its portion of the trail. Um, as soon as we retained Dr. Donahue, we disclosed that he was going to be our expert. We then uh, drafted his disclosure and the parties have all had an opportunity to depose Mr. Dr. Donahue and they did. Um, so this does not come as a surprise to the town and um, the, the nature of the, uh, uh, supplemental pre-trial pre memorandum was merely a, um, as I'm sure the court can appreciate, a function of all the parties in this case trying to get all their ducks in a row right before trial mm -hmm. and squeezing Dr. Donahue in before him, which we all did. I, now, I, I don't fault Harvard for any kind of late disclosure, by the way. I'm, oh, I'm, good. Okay. I'm in, well, uh, and then I understand I'm, I brought them in later, in <laughs> fact, probably after we'd already heard the motions eliminate. As to the substance of um, what Mr. Bott said, I, I want to just address two things. To, to think that you can somehow alienate what he deemed politics of the development of land use and history is, 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 um, is, is contrary to what I'm sure Dr. Donahue at some point could explain as to the evolution of land holdings in the town. I mean, it is political by nature how this all happened. Um, at some point, we're talking about a situation, this is pre-revolution. Uh, these are these are colonial politics at play. Who owns what? Do I allow you to break off? Does Lincoln get to be its own town? Does Carlisle get to be its own town? Are we going to pay for a road? And um, there's an expression like all politics are local. I think this is actually probably uh, the origins of this expression. How did this road come to be is as granular as you could get in terms of local politics. And it is in in this situation where we have a conditional layout that is arguably, and we say certainly ambiguous, you need the historical context of the politics on the ground. And this is the type of information petitions in the town records that Dr. Donahue would consider and did consider um, similar town records in his uh, acclaimed book, The Great Meadows. So to think you can somehow divorce local politics from a narrative as to why this road was was sought whether what how or it was ever established and what effect that has I think is um, would would be a great disservice to the court in assessing what is actually what actually happened during the 18th century. I, now I, moving moving to the the layout aspect of it, I I I am happy to lay further foundation for Dr. Hugh if, if Dr. Donahue if necessary. I will say that I believe yesterday we covered how he has reviewed centuries of town records for his research that also spanned, spanned over a decade. He is the most well-published person in this regard about you land case, usage. You don't, you don't have to argue in advance. Um, I told you I'm gonna hear what you have to say, but you're gonna have to lay a foundation for every aspect of his testimony. Um, I understood. You've got a wide ranging uh, series of topics. Uh, and, and, I, and I gotta tell you, it, you know, Mr. Bat's objection, uh, I didn't need to hear that for me to think this covers a wide range that sounds to me like it may go beyond what Professor Donahue explained as his expertise yesterday. So you'll have to lay a foundation and we'll take it subject by subject and step by step. And I will have Massachusetts Guide to Evidence 703 in mind when I'm listening to you. And uh, 
I'll make rulings as uh, appropriate, okay? Your Honor, may I have one second to confer with my co-counsel? Sure. Um, good morning, Dr. Donahue. Um, Dr. Donahue, uh, you heard Mr. Batt's comments, and so I want to go through, um, as an environmental historian, some of the types of information you might rely on. Um, Dr. Donahue, you have testified that you have reviewed town records, both in this case and uh, prior to this case, for your research for your book, The Great Meadow. Is that fair to say? Correct. Okay, and um, informing, and I believe you characterized your book, The Great Meadow, as assessing um, the origins of, or, or um, well, how would you describe the top subject matter of your book, The Great Meadow? Well, it was a look at the way the town of Concord was settled and developed over the first five generations or so of settlement. And, uh, the way land was settled and used by farmers within the broader context of the way the town developed its its economic position within the colony um you know I, things of that nature and to assess development of the town during that time period would you review uh petitions in the town record books certainly would you say that uh, those petitions could cover a broad range of subject matters? Of course. Um, and would those subject matters sometimes include the, uh, the uh, differing points of views regarding the evolution of the community? Well, I think you could say that. And um, have you ever, in the course of your studies, been required to study political events, events or tensions for purposes of your work? Yes, well, yeah, to, to be trained as, a, as an environmental historian is, is not a particularly narrow uh, set of training. I got a doctorate in history at Brandeis University from one of the leading um, programs in American social history. Uh, in the country. Uh, my mentors were John Demos, who's now at Yale Emeritus, uh, one of the great social historians of colonial New England, John Hackett, David Hackett Fisher. Um, you know, to, to get a doctorate before you embark on your own research, you, you get trained in a very broad um, understanding of, of, uh, of American history. And in my case, in particular, of colonial and uh, history. So I mean, a foundation in terms of my training would be several years of, of um, seminars and papers and broad reading and secondary literature of, of these kinds of issues in colonial New England at the time. So all that serves as a kind of background to the more particular work that I focused on within the town of Concord. And obviously, Bob Gross's book is a great help, as any historian would consult all of the secondary literature in, in the area in, in order to try to situate your work within it so that other historians can, can look at it and see how it fits. But in the course of your work for this case and The Great Meadow, you reviewed other secondary, secondary sources of history. Of course. Um, so, um, Dr. Donahue, you mentioned, mentioned um, social history. How does social history uh, interact with the evolution of the land and environmental history in, in colonial periods in New England? Um, so, I 
you want to understand the dynamics within the community, within families of, um, of who's doing work, of uh, the local economic history. I mean, you're, you're trying to understand the way these communities function politically, economically, socially, at the, at the family level, at the community level, within the broader colony, within the North Atlantic, larger you know, colony of uh, economy of the British Empire. All those sorts of things are going to inform my particular interest in the way they're farming. Are they farming mostly to sell things on the market? Are they farming for their own use? Um, as land is divided from generation to generation and passed down, what kinds of tensions are there? Do you want the children to stay near home to form new farms? Are they going to go to the frontier? What happens? You know, as the town fills up with people and land is less available, everything, you know, what happens to yields of crops as there's less manure available, all those kinds of particular questions have to do with the broader development of the town. It's impossible to address them without, without some kind of understanding of, of, um, of what, what else is going on. And of course, in doing the particular research, I would encounter a lot of other kinds of of evidence on these other questions. Um, so um, exactly, or well, not exactly, I suppose, given the broad range of time, but if you had to estimate how much time have you spent reviewing town records in the court, the Concord town records specifically in the course of your career? Um, several hundred hours easily, probably, I don't know, could run. I'd have to sit here and do a little math, you know, uh, a lot. Um, and um, for this case alone, if you had to estimate how many deeds you looked at, what, what would you estimate that as? For this case? Oh, uh, dozens, maybe not as many as 100. And um, for your research in the Great Meadows, if you had to estimate, and it might be hard, I know it's a little while back, how many deeds do you think you would have reviewed? Oh, um, many thousand. You know, sitting there in the, in the basement of the Registry of Deeds on the way to family court in courtroom five by the boiler room, uh, years and years of uh, looking at those early books and uh, abstracting them and parsing out where they might be. And can you explain how, what, if any, as, as an environmental historian, how you would utilize those deeds to create a narrative of what happened on the ground centuries ago. We talked about that a little yesterday. I mean, it would, the deeds, what I would do would, again, very similar to uh, what, what a, a surveyor would do would be to place each deed in the context of its surrounding deeds and the way it's, it, the way it's bounded. Um, it's a sort of a jigsaw puzzle as everyone who does this work knows. And um, it can be very confusing for people who haven't done much of it because often you encounter many of the same abutters because their land holdings are scattered and they have the same neighbors near their homestead as they do with their outlands. So you have to take you know, very particular notice of who's where and when and how the land is being described. Um, so as I say, I use that to form these um, maps of, the, of where, um, where parcels were located. Now, um, Dr. Donahue, you testified regarding farm usage and evolution of the land. And as an environmental historian, how does uh, roads or car paths or ways, whether they're formal or informal, play into your analysis of the evolution of the land during colonial time? Well, for one thing, they're very helpful in, in locating uh, particular parcels because there's something that they bound against that you, you, know, you may know something about. So they're one of the, they're, they're just kind of a direct aid within the evidence in that way. Um, and then in, in a general sense, once you have, once you, once I would know where they ran and uh, what kinds of land they were running to, uh, they, they help inform uh, 
you know, how the land is being used and how the ways are being used in conjunction with the land. And does that, um, is there a connection to how the ways are being used with what you deem the social history of the era? Well, of course, surely uh, as, the, as the town develops, the way the land is being used changes as well. What may have been a way to a, a remote woodland or pasture in the corner of town by the second or third or fourth generation, some a grandchild is now going to be putting a homestead up in that part of town and the kinds of what the, 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 way, the, the way in which the way is being used will change over, over time. Will it be sufficient as you know, we're gonna be discussing that it just passes through many other parcels of land and you have to take down bars or would you want an open way that you can get down more conveniently? Those kinds of, uh, of questions about ways are, are tied into the social and demographic uh, development of, of the town. These things are all interconnected. So, Your Honor, I'd like to restate my objection. Uh, reflecting back on this testimony, um, we have no objection about Dr. Donahue testifying about the way ways were used. Uh, we had an archaeologist who testified about how ways were used and what their function and purpose might have been. We're objecting to his interpretation of the document 1763 layout and similar documents. Uh, and that's the interpretation that we're looking at. Similarly with deeds, we have no objection to general land history that Dr. Donahue is going to testify, land holding patterns, but it's the interpretation of those documents. Despite his review of many of them, he's not reviewing them with the same eye that a land surveyor with the standards that a land surveyor uses and the reasons that we have certification of, of those standards, Your Honor. Well, Mr. Bat, he hasn't actually offered an opinion yet. So, and, and I don't believe Ms. King is through, or she may be qualifying him in certain aspects of his testimony before asking for an opinion. So I, I appreciate your, your objection, but I'm gonna reserve any ruling on the admissibility of any part of Professor Donahue's testimony until we've heard a little more and until an opinion is offered. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, Dr. Donahue, I know we're um, hopefully going to have you testify regarding both the 17th and 18th centuries, but to start with, I'd like to start in the mid 18th century. And I'm going to pull up what's uh, exhibit 24. Dr. Donahue, do you recognize this document? Yes, I do. I think we've seen that one before. And what do you understand this document to be? This is a, a plan drawn of um, in 1754 at, at the, the first time that the District of Car Carlisle was established, which lasted about two years. Uh, and it shows the uh, location of households along some ways in the part of the north part of Concord that remained with the town of Concord. And um, when you say first district of Carlisle, what does that mean? Well, as we were just starting to discuss a little bit there, the, uh, as these towns such as Concord, the early towns in the, in, um, the Commonwealth uh, began to fill up with um, new farms, they, the new farms were formed out toward the, further and further out toward the edges of the town. And it, it got to the point where it's difficult for the, for the um, outlivers, the, the people living several miles from the meeting house to make it to town, to the church meeting every Sunday and so forth. So uh, these, these communities sort of in the corners of towns began to, to look to form their own towns and communities. They sometimes started as a district within the existing town. They would petition to the legislature um, to be set aside, to set off as a new community and have their own minister preach to them, um, get a new meeting house. And these, <clears throat> so 
what we're seeing here is um, the first time this was attempted and put into place by the by the some people up in the north part of Concord that then became Carlisle. Objection, Your Honor, to strike the last uh, bit of testimony. Uh, there's nothing on the face of this document that speaks to what Dr. Donahue has just said. It's difficult to read. It talks about a petition of, I believe, Joseph Wright. Uh, we, I believe if the document was scrolled up and we could see the upper uh, left-hand corner, we would see a, uh, there's Joseph Wright up top. Uh, we don't know that this has anything to do with the separation of uh, Carlisle as a district. I, I, under I understood the testimony from a few days ago to, uh, I thought there was a general agreement that there was uh, an ill-fated division of Carlisle from Concord from 1754 to 1756. And you, this exhibit showed it. Your Honor, we objected to this exhi exhibit when it did come up, I believe in the cross of uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Vanos. Let him finish, please. Uh, we don't object to it as an exhibit, Your Honor. It is an agreed exhibit. It shows what it shows. And we also acknowledge that there was a district of Carlisle that separated out between 1754 and 1756 or seven. It's just this exhibit with this line on it, we don't see anything in the face of this document that says this line, blood's projected line, has anything to do with that separation. Your Honor. Uh, yeah, Ms. King. Um, I, ju I just want to note, and I, I, I know we'll be doing this dance repeatedly, but to this, to this map, it, and two things I want to say. One, if Your Honor would allow us to continue, you will see the evidence we will provide that further articulates what um, Dr. Donahue has begun to testify on. But two, this document is a map that the plaintiffs in this case contend shows the road at issue as it is delineated here by Benjamin Clarks. Now, as your honor is aware, the town is contending that this road or a portion of this road existed possibly by the time of this map. If a map showing the road uh, against the boundary it is at all to be considered what that boundary is, why it was there, and how one should interpret this map would be necessary to understand the context for this map. And Dr. Donahue is qualified to testify as such. All right, I have a, a, a question to ask the parties first. So the little portion of Estabrook Road that's shown on this map, right, with Clark up to the right of the cursor, that's the portion coming out of Barnes Hill Road, correct? Yes. The southern part. So the line split with blood something, blood's line, whatever it is, which purportedly delineates the two-year uh, Carlisle district okay. is way south of where Carlisle ended up in 17. That's correct, Your Honor. And that's important context that Dr. Donahue can provide. And uh, we, the next exhibit that we were going to propose to bring up would provide context for actually where you could place that boundary specifically right. on this road. Mr. Bat, Mr. Bat, do you disagree that that line showed that, that there was testimony from, I believe, your witness saying that that's what that line delineated? The no, Your Honor, our witness did not testify that that line delineated anything other than perhaps uh, the land holdings of the Bloods, who were a major landholder up in the north east part of uh, then Concord that later broke off to Carlisle. So there's nothing on the face of this document that seems to indicate that Bloods projected line. There may be other information, but so far it's pure speculation. So you're pointing out that there's, there's, nothing, on this, there's nothing on this map that says here's the mm -hmm. Carlisle district. That's right, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Well, all right. I... I I understand that now, and um, I, I'm going to let Ms. King continue her 
for questioning. And I, I understand your objection and I'm overruling it for now, but um, I, we'll, we'll uh, take it one step at a time, okay? Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Donahue, do you see the uh, straight line that proceeds from roughly the bottom right-hand side of the page to the upper left side of the I page? That they, can you describe for the court what your understanding of that is? Well, it says on the plan, it says blood's projected line. And then if you look to the left, it says this plan describes the, the tract of land lying between the projected uh, bounds of Jonathan Blood, oh, of, and others. And what is your understanding of what Blood's projected line would mean contextually during this time period? Well, Jonathan Blood, as it says right there, was one of the petitioners to form this new district. And as the plan says, this is the line that describes the boundary between the proposed district and the rest of Concord. Uh, it and seems clear to me. I'm speculative, Your Honor. Overall. Um, did you go ahead, go ahead, Dr. Donahue? You sounded like you were. It's a little uh, hard to read right here, but it's something. Then does, it then refers to the to the petition. Uh, let's bring up what's um, been marked as the new contested exhibit GG. Um, Dr. Donahue, have you seen this document before? Uh, yes, I have. And uh, what do you understand this document to be? Well, the, because of the difficulty of locating a meeting house, the, there was a petition to the legislature. I'll just, to, I just want, I just want you to quickly just say what you, what, what, a to, one top, one sentence, what you understand this document to be. Uh, it was a petition to the legislature from some of the residents of the new district to return to Concord. And um, have you, have you, is this document relevant to your opinion in this case? Yes. Okay. It's really I, I, for him I, to decide what's relevant to this case. Well, I, I want to establish that he has relied on this in forming his opinion. I'm right, happy to walk through that. it. Okay. Dr. Donahue, did you rely on this document in informing your opinion? I did. I move for this to be admitted, but I, I understand if your honor would like me to ask some more questions about it first. Any objection, Mr. Uh, objection that I, I think more foundation, particularly since it's virtually illegible, uh, even in the um, copy that we received, uh, there's names on it. The script at the top is uh, not clear. Uh, we think at least identification of this document uh, is, is called for. Uh, Ms. King, I, I, Dr. Donahue has characterized it, but I don't know what it says. Dr. Donahue, if we scroll in, would you be able to read it? Or, or... <clears throat> and I refer you to, um, you, you should have a copy of this in, let's replace the binder. Mm -hmm. Your Honor, I just, may mention that we received this midday late yesterday we were still in trial i believe uh so it's, it's proposed it's contested gg um your honor if i may provide some context for this document we initially in the contested exhibits had an excerpt from shattuck which is a um a, a treatise on the history of concord and it quoted this document and the uh, plaintiffs in this case objected on the grounds of hearsay. We've since been able to obtain the original of the document that was quoted. I did circulate it to counsel over the weekend asking if they would agree that I exchange it for the document they had concerns with on grounds of hearsay. They did not respond. So we submitted it yesterday. All right. I'm looking at what I have is contested GG and it's. I believe that's the excerpt from Shattuck that this was to replace your honor. So this, okay. So the Shattuck is a transcription of this? Shattuck references the signatories of those who remonstrated against this petition and that's significant in the analysis of the case. And also, as you'll see, Your Honor, on the first page of this document, there is a firm indication as to where that property boundary is by the listing of one petitioner who is of note in this case. 
All right. Well, I need to hear more about what it is because I can't read any of it to easily understand. Dr. Donahue, what do you understand this document to be? I understand it to be a petition uh, of a group of uh, people in the new district of Carlisle wishing to return to the town of Concord. And um, Vanessa, could you scroll up to the, or down to the second page, please? Please. Could you zoom out, please? Dr. Donahue, have you seen this document before? I have. And um, it, can you explain, there's two pages in this document. This is one page. And then the other page you were looking at. And Vanessa, can you go back to the other page for a second, please? And do you see those signatures on this page? I do. And do you see the, and the other and the signatures on the other page? Can you explain to the court what you understand, if you have any understanding, as to the distinction between this page of signatures and the other page of signatures? I would have to zoom in and see the names a little better. There was a group that wished to return, and there was a group that opposed the petition to return. This is the group that wished to return, I believe. For your record, your, the record, Your Honor, he's looking at page two of this document. Dr. Donahue, are there any names of note on this list of, of um, inhabitants who wish to return to Concord, in your opinion? Well, there's names that we have seen in the 1763 layout. For instance, Jonathan Buttrick is in there. He lived over on Monument Street. Uh, there's a long list there. Uh, there's Jonathan Harris. I think I, if everyone is seeing the same cursor I am on the right-hand side, Jonathan Harris, of course, was the, the next, next um, place up the road beyond uh, Benjamin Clark. So that it kind of locates that boundary line between Clark and Harris. So Harris wishes to return to Concord. So the boundary and the projected blood, blood, projected bloods farm line, excuse me, in what was exhibit 24, Jonathan Harris's signature on this petition to return, it informs your positioning of where that line is? Well, yes. He must have been within the district. He must have been within the district that was created so that he could either wish to return or not. And it turns out he wished to return. Objection, motion to strike as speculation, the last uh, sentence or so. We have no reason to believe that just because Jonathan Harris is on the signature that his land was in Carlisle at the time. Some land may have been. It's not clear what parcel of land he might have been wanting to return to Concord. I'll overrule it. It's a fair inference. Vanessa, could you turn to the um, first page of this document and scroll down and zoom out a little bit so it's a little bit more contextual. Is there a date on this document? There is, Your Honor. I'm sorry. Okay. Do you want to tell me what this says um, June 10th, 1755. Um, could you scroll down, Vanessa, a little bit? Right there. A little bit more so you can read that sentence. Dr. Donahue, can you read that sentence? Uh, right there above the list of names. <clears throat> the names of those of the District of Carlisle that did not. Is that sign to, uh, to something back to the town of Concord is as follows. To be laid back to the town of Concord that, as follows. That looks good. Okay, and Vanessa, could you scroll down a little bit so Dr. Donahue can see all the names here? Now, Dr. Donahue, there's numerous names here and we will not go through all of them, but are there any names in this petition that inform your opinion as you look at the narrative of this case? 
Yes. <clears throat> and which ones are those? Well, Nathaniel Taylor Jr. is, of course, the first call on the 1763 layout, so we know where he is. Uh, Joseph Taylor appears on some of the petitions uh, for ways, as do in the next column, John Hartwell and Simon Hartwell. Um, among these names are quite a few of those people, Timothy Wilkins in the third column, Captain John Green. These are people living up, obviously, in that district of Carlisle. They're going to be, they're going to be names we'll see again. Your so, Honor, at this go ahead. Your Honor, at this point, I'd like to admit this. It may be so admitted. It's um, is it what one twenty eight? Yes. Um, yes. So, um, Dr. Donahue, just to close the loop on the first district of. Carlisle. What is the genesis, in your opinion, for the first district of Carlisle? The genesis of it, uh, as we were speaking about before, they, they found themselves settling uh, places that were three or four miles from the center of Concord. The North Bridge was difficult to pass in the winter, famously. And um, so they began to go through the process of, of forming their own district. At the same time, they were asking, petitioning, as we well know, for better ways to get down to Concord. Uh, so that was the genesis of this district. And, and what, do you know why it ended? It ended because they were unsuccessful in locating a meeting house. And so there was a petition of some of these folks to return to Concord. Um. Uh, actually, Vanessa, could you bring that, uh, that what well, was a contested exhibit, GG, back up one more second? Yeah, Dr. Donahue, there's, I want to scroll down to the bottom of this list. <laughs> For the record, this is exhibit 128 now. Yes. Uh, I, I realize we might not have noted to the court all the names. Are there any other names on this that, that were of interest? Well, there's Samuel Kibbe. And it's interesting to me that in this instance, he wished to remain uh, in the new district of Carlisle. Whereas, as we know later on, when the Carlisle district finally succeeded in 1780, he was a holdout and wanted to go back to Concord. And does this um, inform an opinion as to when Mr. Kibbe might have begun to reside in his homestead, which we've heard some testimony about in this case. Well, it indicates that he was in um, this district of Carlisle at that time, in the same way as Jonathan Harris. Um, and I want to look, I apologize, yes. there's so many names. Um, in the middle column towards the, the, the bottom, right there at the very bottom, it almost looks like it says huge Smith, but I yes. don't think that's how we would interpret that. Who do you understand that to be? I'm sorry, that, that, that would look said to be Hugh Smith, another one of the uh, people along the, or landowners along the way that was laid out in 1763 and appearing on some of the petitions. Okay, okay we can take this down now. Okay, Dr. Donahue, I'd like to now show you what is exhibit 77. <clears throat> Dr. Donahue, do you recognize this document? Do. Um, I look at this, Your Honor. Sorry? I'm just trying to get my binder. <laughs> These are title exhibits, I believe. <laughs> Correct, sorry. Okay, 
Mr. Bott, are you ready for me to proceed? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so, uh, Dr. Donahue, you recognize this document? I do. Did you consider this document in your analysis? I did. What do you understand this document to be? It's a deed of gift for love of men named Timothy Wilkins to a, a group of other men and one woman, actually. Um, and he's giving them some land near his house uh, to, uh, for a place to build a meeting house. Um, and the date of this deed? 1758, I believe. And I just wanna bring up what's chalk, oh, very quickly. Actually, you know what, we, we can write it down. Okay. Um, what, if any, significance do you take from this document? Um, I take the significance that the, the people in Carlisle are following through on another attempt to, to get a minister and to get a meeting house. And they found a location for it. I believe that it's acknowledged to be the pretty much the same site as the as the church is today there in the center of Carlisle. Objection, Absolutely. Your Honor. We haven't, I don't know that based on what that acknowledgement is, motion to strike that piece of testimony. Sustained. Dr. Donahue, do you have an understanding as to where that piece of land of Timothy Wilkins is? And I'm gonna bring up Chaco. Yes. Dr. Donahue, this is a chalk. Do you know what this chalk is overlaid on? Uh, the underlying the map is the plan from 1779 that went along with the petitions that finally succeeded in forming the district of Carlisle by 1780. You can bring this chalk down. Um, and do you, for the record, the exhibit of this is exhibit, the exhibit number for the base map is exhibit 25. Um, you can bring this down. Yeah. Um, now, Dr. Donahue, um, I want to show you one more document. This is contested exhibit HH. Dr. Donahue, have you seen this document before? I have. And what is your under, or, um, and did you consider this document in your analysis? Yes. And what do you understand this document to be? Um, what, is the, what is the date of it, first of all? 1760. For the record, we are looking at contested exhibit HH. Um, and Dr. Donahue, what, if anything, is the significance of this document to your analysis? Well, it concerns the desire of the people who are signed at the bottom, who are some of these same people up in Carlisle, to, um, they want to be excused from playing, paying the minister's rate in Concord. They're asking for a town meeting to be held so that, uh, so that, the, their, the town can vote to excuse them from paying for the minister in Concord because now they have formed their own, built their own meeting house and have a minister. So they don't want to pay twice. And how can you conclude from this document that they've built their own meeting house at this point in 1760? I think it says that at the bottom there, as long as, uh, as, long as we hear preaching, can you read where it says that? As long as the, you put your hand right at the bottom, Vanessa, as long as we, as we hire preaching in the new meeting house, which we and others have built. So Dr. Donahue, this document again is dated October 8th, 1760. And the, uh, the deed we just read from Timothy Wilkins was I believe in 1758. Correct. As a historian, does this assist you in determining when and where a meeting house and what we now know as Carlisle was built? 
Yes, it does. And how is that? Well, clearly it's been built uh, on that site. And, and Dr. Donahue, you testified yesterday that in addition to exploring the trail at issue and the surrounding areas, you also drove north from the trail. Did you have the opportunity to observe where that meeting house currently stands today? I did. Is it your understanding that that's in the same location as where the meeting house built by 1760 was? Your Honor, foundation to make that uh, correlation. I'll allow it. You can answer. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I have driven north past it. I, I visited it in the past. I may have even given a talk there, but I believe there's a plaque on the door that says so, that it's the, on the same site as the, uh, or near the front door of the church, that it's either on or close to the, the site where the original meeting house was built. Objection here, say you're on based uh, on that plaque. That's sustained, that's the basis of his understanding. His testimony is not based on his historical research. Can you take that down if you don't need it anymore, Ms. King? Yes, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Thank you for reminding me. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor, one second. Your Honor, um, I know we have taken a contested exhibit H, H down, but I'd like to admit it at this time. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mr. Pat? This uh, exhibit HH, um, we object to its relevance, Your Honor. Um, it talks about the minister's rate. Uh, that goes way beyond what we're talking about, a layout of a road. Um, the fact that they've hired their minister, once again, it, it, it begins to enter into uh, large areas that aren't terribly relevant to whether Estbrook Road was laid out. Well, I understand the defendant's argument that to be that because the meeting house was built in Carlisle by apparently 1760, there was no need for a road. I'm not sure that one follows from the other, but that's part of their case and they're entitled to try and make that case. So I'm going to allow this into evidence. So contested exhibit HH, which is a Petition to the Selectmen, Concord, dated sometime in 17. October 8th, 1760. Thank you, Ms. King. May be admitted as Exhibit 129. Now, Dr. Donahue, that document did mention the minister's rate. Yes. Does The, does the minister's rate, as it is referred to in that document, inf inform your analysis in this case? It does. And how does the minister's rate, as it is in that document, inform your analysis in this case? Well, I think as we look at the string of petitions and road layouts and they're voted, being voted up and down that are gonna be coming in the next few years here to lead up to the 1763 layout, we'll see that simultaneously, sometimes at the same meetings, there's contention over whether or not these people can be excused from the minister's rate. And there's repeated attempts to form the new district of Carlisle. So as an historian, I see that the context for the, for the attempt to get more ways laid out is a, is a bit more complicated than just the simple one on the surface of trying to get a road down to the center of Concord. Why? That testimony, there are of course many issues that may come up between residents, inhabitants of Concord and Carlisle. 
the minister's rate. We'll hear about schoolhouses. There's a breadth. And of- I, I understand that. And I, I certainly understand that. And I certainly am not. Uh, I, I didn't even take Dr. Uh, Professor Donahue's um, testimony just now to say otherwise. It's, it's one of the things. And I, I understood him when he says it's complicated, he's saying there are, there are probably many considerations. And I understand that to be one of them only. I want to move on, Ms. Kim. Um, Dr. Donahue, to quickly close the loop on that, what are the financial implications of the minister's rate for these Northerners? The financial implications for the Northerners are that they're paying. Uh, they're paying for two ministers, their new one and the, the one down in the town of Concord. The financial implications for the people of Concord is that they're gonna lose part of their tax base if they, if they allow these, these people to stop paying for their minister. Dr. John Hugh, why would they have to pay the minister's rate in Concord if they were going to the Carlisle Meeting House? Because the people in the town of Concord want them to continue paying. The, the people and the, the problem for the town of Concord is that it's, it's as these new towns such as Lincoln, which happened in 1754 and now Carlisle are, are trying to break away, they're going to lose in a direct financial way, they're going to lose part of the people who are paying for all these services within their town so that their own burden will rise. That's an important matter of contention between them. Um, Here, may I object to relevance again? This is very speculative. It goes beyond the qualifications. Uh, Professor Donahue is not a religious historian. Uh, these are religious fights. There are, of course, many in Many of these towns, they have very little to do with the land use, the environment, et cetera. So I have a standing objection to this line of questioning, Your Honor. I don't want to do it unnecessarily. I understand, Mr. Bat. I'm going to overrule the objection. Um, Dr. Donahue, do you know, uh, to your knowledge, did the town excuse the petitioners from paying their minister's rate after this petition in 1760? Not after this one. I believe that... There were times coming on a decade or so later where they did um, excuse the Northerners. It went back and forth. Um, Dr. Donahue, I am now moving forward in time to, or a little bit, I suppose, to uh, uh, exhibit seven. This is this. Have you seen this document before, Dr. Donahue? Yes, I think we've seen this before. This is a a petition for a way from 14 uh, residents up there in the northern part of Concord that would become Carlisle. They're asking to if there could be granted a, a way, um, a convenient way to accommodate Hugh Smith and those others, including Samuel Kibbe, to go to public worship and to market. They're also saying that if there's a way already allowed that will accommodate them, um, could that be made an open way? Um, and so what did this, did this document inform your analysis in this yes. case? And what from this document contributed to your analysis? Well, several things. Um, it, it's obviously going to lead to some response from the town of Concord as to where that way might be proposed to run. So we'll see that. Um, where else is the names on it are significant. Um, Why are the names on this significant to you? Well, it shows uh, some of those same folks uh, that we're going to see at least some of their names in subsequent petitions. Um, it includes Samuel Kibbe, of course, and Zacchaeus Green. It also includes a couple of gentlemen there who we saw on that earlier 1755 uh, piece, uh, John Hartwell and Simon Hartwell. They're interesting to me. Um, because they're not in the same location within the town of Carlisle. They're further over in the West and they're on a perfectly good, you know, laid out roads, now Lowell Road, Chelmsford Road, 
Your Honor, could, or, sorry, Dr. Dr. Anahue, I want to stop you there for a second. Can we bring right. Chalk O up for reference for this? Uh, Dr. Donahue, as we already established, you're familiar with this document. This is chalk O, and this is a chalk with some demarcations over it, indicating some names. Can you uh, orient the court as to if and where you see those two Hartwells you just um, referred to? In the West, Simon and John Hartwell, they're above the, I believe is marked as the road to Concord. That would be Chelmsford Road, as it was called at the down, time. So um, and uh, Vanessa's going to draw her hand right over. Is that the road right there that you're talking about? Right. Um, and uh, Dr. Donahue, what is the significance to you that Simon and John Hartwell were on the petition or on the petition that is exhibit uh, seven? Well, they didn't need a road to Concord. Uh, they had one. So they've got some other motivation to be part of this petition. And what, what, as a historian who studied colon, colonial Concord, what do you deem one of those motivations to be based on the location of John Hartwell and Simon Hartwell? Objection, Your Honor, calls for speculation. Sustained. Um, do the names on this inform your opinion as to the motivations for this petition? The same objection. Let me have that question. You may answer. I would say that yes, they do. And how do they inform your opinion? Well, again, they're, they're petitioned for a road. So they're an indication that there's a desire for a road on the part of these uh, petitioners. It's at least interesting that some of them are apparently not in a position where they would need a road to get to Concord Center. It suggests they might be interested in this road in some other way or they might have some other motivation, but I wouldn't know what that would be. Um, is there anything else that you deem significant to your analysis in this document? Can you scroll up? Well, it's uh, interesting that it's uh, that they're asking for a way to get to public worship when they got a meeting house in Carlisle, uh, just north of many of them. So um, that might be part of their motivation as well. They might be as interested in going north as going south. Your Honor, I, I think the testimony calls for speculation as to the date that the Carlisle meeting house was constructed. This is uh, February 14th, 1760. Uh, I don't know if there's been any evidence as to when that meeting house was actually built. Well, we know from the last exhibit, it was built by October of 1760. So it's likely it was at least under construction at this time. So I'll, I'll allow the answer to stand. Um, Dr. Donahue, I see that it also says, uh, and tell me if I'm reading this right, um, the town will grant a Convenient way to accommodate Hugh Smith, Zacchaeus Cream, Samuel Kibbe, and others to go mm -hmm. to public worship and to market mm -hmm. or see if there be any way already allowed that mm -hmm. will accommodate the person's aforesaid. Did I read that yeah. as you read it? You read, you read that right, and I, and I had mentioned that before, but maybe too briefly. And so it goes on to say... Uh, and it mentions any others that may settle near us. And then it concludes, uh, if there is, if they're to, to open the same as soon as may be. So the implication there is that there, there may be a way to get down to Concord that's already been allowed, uh, but it's not 
it's not an open way. And there is indeed such a way uh, lying to the southeast of them called the Two Rod Road, um, a mile of which was not two rods. It was a one rod right away with gates at either end. So they're, they're looking for some new, at least one, uh, more convenient passage uh, to the town of Concord. It, may, if, if I may go on just about this subject of, of what they're seeking in, in these ways as far as my analysis. Well, like, why don't I ask the, uh, uh, the question, Dr. Donahue. So um, taking into account this document, do you have an opinion as to um, the purpose for seeking these ways? I do. And what is that? Well, I think in looking at the totality of these examples we've been looking at so far and some more that we're going to be looking at, that it seems to me that in seeking these ways, these people have three kind of overlapping and uh, entangled motivations, reasons that they might want a way. And the first is certainly a legitimate need to get to the town of Concord to do their business or, or attend meeting. The second is, as we're seeing there in the process of constructing a new town center and putting in place a meeting house of their own. So they have a motivation, a strong motivation to develop ways in that direction, which is quite expensive to do. Um, they would love it if the town of Concord would, would help pay for that. Uh, because the third thing they're trying to do is still get set off as their own district, at which point they're gonna have to pay for their own roads. Um, so the, the third motivation is that th this is a way of bringing political pressure on the town of Concord to let them go. Objection, Your Honor. Motion to strike the third uh, piece of that testimony. There's nothing. Yeah, in the yeah the, I, I haven't seen anything, um, Ms. King, to support that part of Dr. Donahue's um, opinion in evidence or the suggestion of anything not in evidence that would support that. Um, I'm sorry, what, what was the last sentence? The suggestion that anything... I haven't seen anything either in evidence or a suggestion of anything not in evidence that would support that part of Dr. Donahue's opinion. Okay. Um, you point me to something, I'm going to exclude that portion of his opinion. You're not, uh, Dr. Donahue, what is the basis for the opinion that you just articulated? Well, it's again, the kind of totality of these, these documents. And it's true, we haven't looked at all of them, but it's also the kind of interpretations that, uh, that historians make from reading all these documents. Objection, Your Honor. Um, right, um, speculative. I'm going to... Uh, sustain your objection and strike the last part of the opinion, uh, Ms. King. Uh, I don't believe that that last part of Dr. Donahue's uh, opinion was based on, and I'm quoting now from Massachusetts Guide to Evidence 703, which is a pretty good summary of Massachusetts law. Facts or data not in evidence if the facts or data are independently admissible in evidence and are a permissible basis for the expert to consider in formulating his opinion. Um, That's understood, Your Honor. There's enough in there, okay? Um, Your Honor, I, um, I wonder if, I have a question for you procedurally, and I don't know if you want Dr. Donahue to listen to it or if you'd like to have a conference without Dr. Donahue. Um, but Why don't you take this document off the screen first? Okay. Um, there are multitudes of petitions that establish the minister's rates issues and some of, and the town of Carl Carlisle seeking to be, or the soon to be town of Carlisle um, seeking to be set off um, over dozens. Uh, and they are in our contested exhibit binder. And I am cognizant of the court's time and patience on this matter. And I, I do want to, uh, be cognizant of that and also address the foundation aspect that your honor just noted out. 
And I do look to the court. Would you like us to go through all those petitions? Would you like me to put them together and offer them as a collective document for his review and, and to offer testimony on? Is there a way that you would prefer I approach this, Your Honor? Well, Ms. King, I'm not going to advise you on how to put your case together. And I'm not going to tell you not to put something in because it'll take too long. Okay. I, I, you know, as much as I don't want this case to take 12 days of trial, um, I'm never going to say to you, don't put in your evidence because it's too time consuming. <laughs> However, um, based on what I've heard so far, you know, I, I understand that, you know, Dr. Donahue is a historian and a well-qualified historian, but the rules of evidence to me still don't allow anyone to speculate on matters that either aren't in evidence or, or are not uh, based on observations or documents that conceivably could be in evidence. And to, for instance, simply say, well, I think based on the fact that they signed all these petitions that they were really looking to, among other things, put pressure on Concord to let them go and form their own town again. I think that is without something else speculative. You know, it may be fine to put it in a book, but it's not fine to put it in as a reason for why they did or did not petition for a road. Um, so I'm giving my Honor. answer as most completely as I can. I appreciate that. Your Honor, could, could we have a, a brief moment to confer among you counsel? Know, it's, a quarter, it's a quarter to 11. We'll take our morning break a little early and then um, we'll be back at 11. You can tell me what you want to do. I, and I, again, I don't want to stop you from presenting your case. And there may be parts of some uh, of Dr. Donahue's uh, testimony that you're now anticipating won't get in. I don't know because I don't know what he's going to say. But I'm going to rule on each on each aspect of his testimony based on what is in evidence or based on the rules of evidence with regard to expert opinions, as I understand them. Okay? Understood. Thank okay. you, Your Honor. Sure.
How are you, Miss Saint Amand? I'm fine. How about you? Just fine. A little warm. Yeah, I know. Thank goodness we have central air. Well, we don't. As you <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We are, I understand, the tallest building in the world that relies on window air conditioners. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, welcome back, everyone. Ms. King, Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Dr. Donahue, in this case, you reviewed numerous town records, correct? Numerous town records, yes. Were petitions among those town records? There were petitions among those records. Were there town meeting. warrants among those records? Warrants, town meeting votes. Um, how, how many petitions, if you rush, roughly ha had to estimate, have you reviewed during this time period? Uh, a dozen or two. Um, and as a historian, what themes do you see in those petitions as it relates to this road? Well, some of them were petitions for different ways, uh, new ways, of course. And as, it, as we have previously been discussing, there are petitions to be released from the minister's rate to form a new district of Carlisle, uh, matters having to do with schools and all the rest of that. Um, when you say all the rest of that, what do you mean, Dr. Donahue? Well, I perhaps shouldn't have said, said that, but um, those I've mentioned. And how does, um, can you explain petitions for schools? What, what how does schooling, in your understanding as a historian, relate to the well, development of this area in this time? You Thank you, Your Honor. Once again, relevance. We're, we're not looking for I'll allow, it, school. I'll allow it briefly. Briefly, it was it had to do with the expense of who was paying for schools and also the location of the schoolhouse and how difficult it was to for the children to get there whether one would be established in the north part of town, which for a long time it wasn't. And Dr. Donahue, did you utilize your, did you consider your review of all of the various petitions that you saw during this time period in assessing um, who would want this road and who would not want this road well, and the I reasons did. for that? I did, and I think the key oh, word- oh, oh. The yes or no. I did. Um, and Dr. Donahue, did you hear Ms. Hightert's testimony last week? Yes, I did. Most did you hear her offer her opinion as to the motivations for this road? Yes, I did. Opinion? Somewhat. And what is the basis? What is your opinion and how, if at all, does it differ? Well, restating what I was saying earlier, I think there were multiple mo motivations for this road or any of these ways that they're requesting. One was to get to Concord. The second was to develop roads in the north part of Concord. So roads run north and both north and south, if you will. And the third one that we're referring to that's kind of we're disputing at the moment is the political context for all of this. And my analysis of that as an historian is that 
You know, the way we make these inferences to look at is to look at dozens and dozens of these kinds of events that are occurring at the same time and the individuals involved in them. And uh, if they keep repeating themselves again and again and again, often with a negative outcome for one group of parties, and they come back the next year, and they come back the next year, and they come back the next year, it's a reasonable inference that there's a lot of tension there and, and debate, and, um, and one side side is not getting what it wants. And it just seems to me that if we look at the way this thing plays out from 1754, the beginning of the French and Indian War till 1780, near the end of the Revolutionary War, 25 years of continuous, you know, uh, de debate over these things that we get a reasonable idea that there's a, there's a contentious political issue here and that all these things are part of that. That you really can't look at the, the a mere petition for a road in, in, a, in only the narrow context of reaching the center of Concord, although that's certainly part of it. Okay. Your Honor, I, I would move to strike much of that testimony. Once again, speculation. We don't want to hear about many, many different roads uh, or ways or petitions or the political issues. There's no been no foundation for much of this. And, you know, I, I'm trying not to interrupt too much, Your Honor, but this is continuing to be the line of questioning that we hear here. And, uh, we're talking about one road. There may be a couple other roads that are close by in the North Quarter that are relevant, but there's no foundation for all of this testimony. I think the testimony is of limited relevance. I'm going to deny the motion. Let's move on, okay? Understood, Your Honor. Okay, um, Your Honor, I'm now, or I'm sorry, Dr. Donahue, can I like, now like us to look at what's Exhibit 10? Really? Are you going to put it up or shall I yes. find it? Yes. Um, if it's easier to have it in front of you in no, hard no, no. copy. That's fine. So, so Dr. Donahue, this says Concord May 16th, 1760. And again, this is Exhibit 10. Do you recognize this document? I do. And what do you understand this document to be? Uh, it's one we've seen before again, uh, and it's a, a response to the petition we looked at a bit earlier of Samuel Kibbe and Zacchaeus Green, the, the 14 people who requested the way. And a committee has been established of Jonathan Buttrick and a couple other men. Uh, and they, this is a report in which they say back to the selectman or back to town meeting that they think the request uh, was reasonable. And, uh, and they further think that there was a way formerly, at least as far as the spruce swamp, which might accommodate the petitioners, if it was not obstructed, um, which we think uh, doth appear by an abstract of the town book. So they're saying, they're making a report that they think it's reasonable that these folks should have a road and they, they're suggesting where it might go. And, um... What, if anything, is significant from this to, about this document to your analysis? Well, we're seeing uh, a suggestion of a way in response to the petition from the North that's uh, alternative to the one we're going to see later, and uh, which is interesting. Um, and the, the presence of Jonathan Buttrick uh, on this committee is interesting to me because he's greatly involved in the in the one we're going to see that would cross his land. So. Here he suggests another one. Um, I would draw your own conclusions from that. Okay, I'm now going to show you what's marked as contested exhibit II. All right. <clears throat> Dr. Donahue, do you recognize this document? I do, yes. Um, and what is this document? 
this is the selectmen of Concord the following spring, February 28th. They've laid out a way. And so this is going to be taken to town meeting. And the way that they have laid out at the desire of Zacchaeus Green and others um, follows something like, it, it is in the area that the Jonathan Buttrick and that committee have suggested. Um, so what it describes running south to north uh, is, is a way that runs up through the spruce swamp and reaches Samuel Kibbe and then uh, Zacchaeus Green and goes over to land of, of Ephraim Brown. And um, uh, Dr. Donahue, for reference, I'm gonna, well, Your Honor, first I move to admit this. Any objection? No, Your Honor. It may be, I think it's 1.30. Yes. Um, now, Dr. Donahue, I suggest you actually open to contested exhibit II because I'm gonna bring the map up on the screen, but I wanna make sure you're able to refer to this exhibit while mm -hmm. we bring the map up. Um, Vanessa, could you bring up exhibit 52? I have it. <clears throat> okay, now Dr. Donahue, yesterday you testified that you've had the opportunity to walk both the trail at issue and numerous trails, both to the mm -hmm. east and west. Did you have any opportunity to explore the area described in this um, report or in this layout? I did. And um, could you describe what you observed? Well, I can. Uh, Vanessa, you've got to come out a little bit more. Just a hair, thank you for everyone. So once again, I mean, we, we can't say for certain whether the trails that we see uh, on the ground today are exactly what's described in a layout like this, obviously, from a couple hundred years ago. Objection, Your Honor, uh, as to qualifications to correlate the uh, way described in the document with anything on the ground today? Well, I'm gonna let him explain how he is going to get there before I rule on that. All right, well, the layout um, says that the way begins by coming out of the, the, the uh, what they call Blood's Way, which would be the two rod road. And foundation, and, your honor, objection as to no foundation as to that. Your honor, he has the exhibit in front of him. Yeah, but I think Mr. Bad is, is uh, objecting to the conclusion that two rod way was blood's way. Am I right, Mr. Bad? That's right, Your Honor. Where, where does that come from? Dr. Donahue. Um, how do you know that two rod way comes from blood's way? There were two, uh, I, I can't recall whether these have been brought into evidence yet. So let me proceed as best I can. There were, the town had already laid out two ways to get out, to get to Blood's Farms. One in uh, 1735 that became Monument Street and the second in 1745 lying to the west of that, that's known as the Two Rod Road. I believe Mr. Bonozzi testified to that, but I can't quite recall. So since this is a way that comes from Blood's Way and what it means to do is to reach Samuel Kibbe, and we know where he is. And it's described as cutting, as having to pass through the spruce swamp, which is Carlisle Swamp and Yellow Birch Swamp, as I think was agreed to um, in Mr. Venozzi's testimony, or perhaps Ms. Heitert's. Um, logically, there's a limited number of ways that it could have gone to do that. And when you say logically, what experience do you have that informs that logic as you apply it to the topography on the ground? Well, it has to pass, it has to find a way to get through all those wetlands uh, from, from the two rod way or from, as it's called, Blood's Way to reach Kibbe. And it's a way that, that you know, the, the petition was to get a, a way south to Concord among other things. So that would be the, logic of looking to see whether the trails that are 
exist today, at least may have been uh, something approximating that way. And Dr. Dyer, and I would like to renew my objection to his attempting to place on the ground today uh, any of these layouts, um, whether they're Blood's Farm, uh, the Two Rod Way uh, at the time. Um, yeah, Miss Miss King, this is you know I so far I haven't heard enough. You're, you're establish the witnesses competence to testify to what you appear to be asking him to do with the foundation. Um, Dr. Donahue, and your honor, your point is well taken. If you permit me to ask a few questions to get there, I, I believe yeah, you absolutely. will. Lay all the foundation you want. Um, Dr. Donahue, as an environmental historian, how do you use the topography today to inform your assessment as to what would have existed in the colonial time period. And um, for purposes of focusing on relevancy to this, specifically as it would relate to ways or paths. Uh, certainly, the, many of, I, as I think has already been stated in this case, many of the wetlands that we see today as, as swamps and so forth were meadows in the colonial period, they were used for cutting hay and there had to be ways to reach them. And so then there were often dams at, at, at where the water flowed out of them and so forth. So they give us a series of, of landmarks on the ground. Um, the ways would have to, to be there to reach them. So that's what, for example, Jonathan Blood was referring to when he said there used to be a way to spruce swamp. So um, you've got that, you have the locations of stone walls, um, all those sorts of things that are mentioned in documents of where the homesteads of people are and so forth, um, that you can try to relate to where a way probably would have run and then look at the things we have today. Obviously you cannot make a definite one-to-one -one correlation between what we see today uh, with that time period, but it's at least a, a meaningful exercise to look at the trail as it exists today and ask yourself, would this have served um, uh, as, as a reasonable approximation of the way that's described, or is it simply impassable? Now, Dr. Donahue. Your objection, Your Honor. Well, he, she may have that answer. Thank you. Dr. Donahue, um, did you hear Ms. Heitert's testimony last week as it relates to Kibby's util her belief that Kibby, util Kibby utilized the trail at issue? I believe I did. Um, and is your analysis of this way both um, as it relates to the document itself, which is contested exhibit II. And as you observed what you believe to be um, an approximate location of the way described in contested exhibit II as, okay, as exhibit 130. As in the form of question, Your Honor. Well, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Yet as informing your opinion as it relates to Ms. Ka Ms. Heitert's conclusion that Kibbe must have been using the Esterbrook Trail. Objection, Your Honor. I didn't even understand that. Yeah, That's fine, I, Your Honor. I can rephrase. I, I, I didn't either, Ms. King. So I apologize. Let, let me ask a question. Uh, this, this document, which is now Exhibit 130, this is a petition to establish a road somewhere. This is not the one that ended up getting approved in 1763, right? Shall I answer or they, should they answer? I'm asking Ms. King, thank you. Yes. Um, no, Your Honor, this is an iterative process and the plaintiffs cite the 1760 petition for the identity of the petitioners as they claim it relates to the 1763 layout. Dr. Donahue's testimony on this is relevant in twofold. One, he's explaining that it's an iterative process 
And I'm just asking what it is. This is yeah. one that didn't pass. This is one of the ones that didn't pass on the way to getting the one that did pass in 17. Correct. 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 And you're this trying is... to locate where it was proposed. Are you asking me, Your Honor? Or well, this is. Is this the petition or is this the ruling of the selectman? What is this? Uh, this is a layout. It's a layout, but it did not. It has not been an unaccepted layout. Now, Your Honor, if I may, I think if you allow us to continue, you will see how this testimony is relevant in a few ways. A, it shows that there were multiple ways being explored during this time. And this is obviously one of them. Secondly, um, the plaintiffs have put Mr. Kibbe and his access to the Concord Meeting House at issue and whether that's significant or not, I, this is, that is not the purpose of this testimony. But this clearly, by the way it, it is described, goes by Mr. Kibbe's house. Now the relevance of this document to that part of Ms. Heitert's opinion is that this explores whether there was a road as described in this that Mr. Kibbe had access to. Your Honor, may I respond? Sure, this, this, but this this describes a road that hasn't been built yet or, or one that is in existence in part. I'm not sure that the testimony will support that conclusion, Your Honor. I'm asking, do we know? Well, this, part- Proposing to build a road, right? It, do, it does connect to an already existing road. Right, Mr. Bat. Well, on a couple of grounds, Your Honor, once again, to restate that the, the layout that you see before you, Mr. Dr. Donahue is not qualified to testify as to where it might have run uh, or how it correlates any trails today. Second, uh, to the extent that they're trying to use Mr. Donahue, Dr. Donahue, excuse me, Dr. Donahue to uh, describe uh, the Kibbe parcel and what happened there, we don't believe he's been qualified as an archaeologist. Uh, to, to opine on that kind of information that Ms. Heiter was qualified to, to testify to. So there are several grounds, Your Honor, to strike this line of questioning. Your Honor, if I may briefly question. respond. Yeah. Ms. Heitert was offered as an archaeologist. She offered opinion testimony regarding what ways Mr. Kippy would have utilized, which do not seem to re relate to her qualifications as an archaeologist. Dr. Donahue is an environmental historian. As discussed, he not only has extensive experience in interpreting colonial period town records to interpret what we can deduce and infer from what was happening on the ground in colonial time periods, but he also applies that knowledge to the environment. And in so doing, he uh, assesses the topography, currently and how it would have evolved over the times. Now, I've now noted that Mr. Bat has objected to Dr. Donahue um, testifying about social history, and now he's, into, he's objecting to him and testifying about environmental history. Right. Uh, what we're going to do, if you want Dr. Donahue to testify as to where this proposed road, which apparently was not approved, would have been laid out, he's going to have to explain before each call how he reached that conclusion, okay? So why don't you take him through it, call by call, and I will rule if there's an objection on whether he's laid a sufficient foundation for each one. You're, yes, Your Honor, and, and I'm happy mm -hmm. to do that. May I make one note though? I, I do not hear Dr. Donahue to be testifying that the road in the approximate location as he, as he determined it to be based on this layout is, is essentially this layout. What his testimony, I believe, is being offered for is to describe that there was a way there that was, and then if you will allow us to proceed, his observations as to what he can deduce as to the status of that way by observing it today. Your Honor, the document speaks for itself. Whether there was a way there, document speaks to that. Let me take a moment to read it. No. 
if this way was never actually laid out, I, I'm not really sure I understand the need to show where it would have been if it had been laid out. But if you want to prove that, Dr. Donahue is not a surveyor, but if he is sufficiently familiar with certain historical references in these calls, and he may be familiar with some and maybe not with others, he can attempt to say where it would have been, right? That's my ruling. Let's move on. Thank you, Dr. Donahue. Um, I'm going to bring back up exhibit 52 on the screen. Could you please refer to this exhibit? What has been marked? 130 in front of you. So Dr. Donahue, again, this is a document dated February 28th, 1764. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, that's not the date. So what is the date of this document, Dr. Donahue? 1761, February yes, 28th. Sir. I apologize. Could you please, um, to the extent you're able, bring us through this document uh, with reference to specific calls and your understanding of those calls. And if you are able to make reference to where you are able to understand that call to correlate to today. I don't think you have enough of the map on the screen. I think, I think we do, Your Honor. Just, okay. Okay. Do we need to no. have a, Dr. Donahue, should I bring a map up that shows more of the Carlisle portion? No, that's all right. Okay. Well, to simplify matters, as the judge has, um, has said, I cannot identify all the specific calls on this uh, way, but simply it did come from Blood's Way, which I do believe to be the two rod road because Nothing else would make sense. It arrives at Kibbe. To get there, it has one call in which it has to cross the Spruce Swamp, which I think we have agreement where that is. So to do that, it has to do, it has to cross a series of little brooks that you can see along the way, particularly the one between what's called the Yellow Birch Swamp and the Carlisle Swamp. I cannot identify any of the other specific calls as to, as to where it went or whether they correspond exactly to that trail that we see. The simple point that I would like to make is that there, there was a passable way to go in that direction. And that at those points where there are these little brooks, and there's actually three of them, there's one a little further north, just south of Kibbe's place, that the trail that exists today, there's stones that have filled those brooks so that one can cross them on firm ground. And at one of them, there's an actual stone culvert built with large flat stones. And that was all that I wanted to put in evidence regarding this area. Um, Dr. Donahue. Um, hold, hold on, there's an objection. One, uh, Dr. Donahue has not testified as to whether any of these features that he has just testified to uh, along this trail, or even this landscape, is the same as it was back at the time of this proposed layout. He has also not laid the foundation that Two Rod Road is, and we spoke about this before, is, is the same as Blood's Way. Uh, so I, I think even this limited testimony is, is not um, supported by his qualifications or the foundation that they, has been laid. Your Honor, if I may ask one or two more questions, I believe we will get there. Dr. Donahue. As an environmental historian, you noted that this proposed way would have likely crossed two streams. Could you point out with reference to this map, those two streams you noted? Well, where, the, where the hand is currently is it had, it had to cross there. 
There's and another can you one. describe? Can you describe um, for the record what the hand is hovering near, please? It's near by the Carlisle Swamp, and uh, which was called Spruce Swamp. And what is to the southwest of the of the, the hand yellow, right now? Yellow birch swamp. Okay. Are there? And is that? Is there so, any reason? you conclude that the road as described in exhibit 130 would have had to cross at that location. It had to cross somewhere through there because it was coming from the way the blood's way, which it, if, it, if that were a call for Monument Street, then that way it would have to travel west to get to the two rod way to accomplish what we're talking about here. So there's, there's no logic to the, that it could have been some other uh, blood's way. And therefore it had to make its way um, <clears throat> as it's described through that area between crossing the swamp at that point. Because what bounds on that area that would prohibit a road to the further north of that point or further south of that point? Well, it says it's a leading question. I'm sorry, Mr. Bat. There's a leading question going on here. Um, we don't Let's need to hear. Okay. Well, there's the road is described as running from south to north and it reaches Kibbe. So it's not going to go around the north side of the spruce swamp. It's coming up from the south side, and it begins in the land of Whitaker, which is the portion of the of the two rod road that was actually a one rod right away, and that's in the layout of that road in 1735. So you know we're left with fairly limited number of possibilities of where it, it could have run. Could it have run through Carlisle. What's on this map as Carlisle Swamp? No, it couldn't have. Why not? because you cannot put a way through a swamp. So is it reasonable as an environmental historian in looking at ancient records such as this layout to make certain inferences as to the feasibility as to where the road as described could and could not go? Yes. Matter of objection, speculation, and yeah. qualification. I'm sorry, Your Honor. And, and motion to strike the last response. Your Honor. I'm a little confused, Ms. Kane. Dr. Donahue testified a little while ago that Carlisle Swamp and these other swamps were, were meadows back then. And now he's testifying that it couldn't go through Carlisle Swamp because it was a swamp. So I'm, I'm really confused. That's totally fair. And Your Honor, I will say I have been confused by that myself. So let me, Dr. Donahue. As you heard, the honor is confused as to a swamp and a meadow. Could you please explain? I'd be happy to. And yes, at that time, Carlisle Swamp would most likely have been in a meadow condition. So these wetlands around the town of Concord were converted from their, the vegetation in which this English settlers found them into meadows over the course of time. And the reason that, that was, this was done was in order to generate hay. They wanted to make them grow grass. Some of them were meadowy or grassy when they found them. Um, some of them were not. If they had other kinds of vegetation like shrubs and trees, they were referred to as swamps. The process of making them usable as a meadow would be to introduce some drainage and all, so that you could get out there with an ox cart in the in the summertime, and often, as we've seen, to flood them in the wintertime so that sediment from the water could fertilize them. And we see this throughout the town of Concord, and this is a, a large subject of my book. So, so um, meadow in the colonial era in New England refers specifically not to just any grassy area, but to a wet grassy area. It's a wetland. So you need to have a way that can get you to the edge of it to, so that you can harvest your hay and, and cart it home.
but for a way that's got to reach something else, you have to avoid it. You cannot run the way on the meadow. Many parts of the year, it's going to be too wet. It'll be flooded. Uh, you'll, there'll be drainage ditches within it. So the, the art of, of where these ways run is to find the parts of the topography that miss the wetlands and miss as many of the hills and rocks as possible. So that's what Ms. Heitert was referring to when she talked about this way being impassable. Um, that's what I'm referring to. And um, cognizant of my own confusion of this issue initially, when what is the distinction between a meadow and a pasture? Pasture refers to the way the land is being used. Uh, it's being grazed, in other words. The pastures are, are uplands. All the parts of the landscape that aren't wetlands, that aren't meadows or swamps, um, uh, are referred to generally as upland during this period, but it might be a woodland, it might be a pasture, in other words, an area that to be used pretty much solely for grazing. Um, and so, uh... Dr. Donahue, um, going back to the map exhibit 52, please. You testified that you had the opportunity to walk Carlisle Trail, correct? Correct. What did you observe about the portions of Carlisle Trail um, as it overlapped the streams indicated on this map? I observed that every time it came to a, a wet area or a small brook flowing between these, what are today have reverted to swamps, um, th there was a provision in that trail so that you could cross it without getting your shoes wet. I mean, there were stones put into the, large stones put into the, to the wet areas, uh, reaching the other side to give firm ground. And from that observation, did you, or you, did, did that observation inform your opinion as to whether a way, way as described in Exhibit 130 or similar thereto could have been passable? Objection, Your Honor. Yes, it did. If there, if there had been a way following more or less the, the, the route of that trail, it would have been you with an ox cart or or whatever you might have, you would be able to not only walk across it, but, but drive a, a, a cart across it. Thank you. And so it indicated Dr. that- Dr. Donahue. I'm sorry. I'm now um, um, uh, Is that okay? I'm now uh, bringing up ex contested exhibit LL. Dr. John Hugh, do you recognize this document? I do. And um, what do you understand this document to be? I'm trying to get my head back in this here. It's minutes of town meeting, 1761. Is that correct? Yes, and um, did this document inform your analysis of this case? Uh, it did. How? Can you scroll down a little bit? Uh, it's another um, petition to be excused from the minister's rate for the new inhabitants of the northerly part of Concord while they have preaching uh, among themselves. And what, um, do you understand what happened to that request in this document? Passed in the negative. Your Honor, I offer this. 
Matt? Uh, I, I object this is not relevant to the uh, matter that we're- okay. Again, Ms. King, what is this? It's a petition to- Well, as it says, Your Honor, it's the, join... this is a town vote. And the question was put whether the town would discharge some of the inhabitants in the northerly part of Concord from their minister's rate while they have preaching among themselves, agreeable to the request of Mr. Solomon Andrews and others. And it also, at the, above that, it says, um, after some debate, the question was whether the town would set off those inhabitants in the northerly part of Concord to join with others of Bill Ricca, Chelmsford, and Acton in order to be in incorporated into a town or district agreeable to ye request of Mr. Solomon Andrews and others and a pass in the negative. And this is 1761? Mm -hmm. Yes. Same objection, Your Honor, to relevance. It may be marked exhibit 131, I believe. Yes. Dr. Donahue, how did this inform your analysis in this case? Well, um, it's, an, it's another instance of it, the exact time, same time period um, where the, this way was uh, brought up and then at, I think a different meeting, but in the same year passed over. And so as the judges observed, it never actually became a, a formally laid out way uh, occurring right in the same time frame as these, these other kinds of, of votes. Okay, Dr. Donahue. I'm now bringing you, your attention to what's exhibit 13. Okay. You want to bring it up or? Take a moment to review this, Dr. Donahue. Okay. Yes, I know, I know what it is. Okay, Dr. Donahue, again, for the record, this is exhibit um, 13. Can you identify this document, please? Uh, it's a layout by the selectmen again. We've moved to November 1762, so the end of the next year. It indicates to us that a, a petition, another petition has come in for a way since the one before was not approved. Uh, never made it through town meeting. It was at the request of Zacchaeus Green and Joseph Taylor. The name Joseph Taylor is significant because that man is not on the 1760 petition. What so does that know, tell you? What does that tell you that he's not on the 1760 petition? That although we don't have it, that there must have been a subsequent petition that led to this layout. The layout is also by Zacchaeus Green and others. So uh, it's the, it, as we can see from where the, the roads were laid out and proposed, it's addressing the same kinds of issues. This is the one that begins at Nathaniel Taylor Jr.'s and comes on down. It's the first half of it there is the same as the county's 1763 layout that's going to follow. Um. And through, through Buttrick's pasture and all that. Um, and when you say through Buttrick's pasture and all that, and, uh, can you be a little bit more specific as to what you're referring to, please? The, the end of this one, just as in the county petition after it was appealed, uh, ends, it, you know, it runs under the hill through said Buttrick's pasture, through Jonathan Buttrick's pasture, till it comes to the way that is laid out. They then put pros a second way in the same layout, which we see below. This run, one, if we follow the calls on it from beginning to end, runs east. It apparently begins at the way that has just been laid out at the, the stump and stones in Edward Brown's land. And it proceeds east uh, through past Zacchaeus Green's barn and house. Uh, which the previous layout reached from Samuel Kibbe coming up from the south, if you'll recall. But this one doesn't go to Kibbe. It continues east, and it goes through some other land that I do not know where that all is. But um, once again, it ends at uh, 
can see uh, Blood's Corner, so the same corner to the Blood's Road. So it strikes the same two rod road, but it does northerly of the Spruce Swamp and it doesn't serve Samuel Kibbe. So it appears to be another attempt to satisfy the requests of the, the same group of people. And, and do you know what happens to this attempt? Let's go to exhibit 15. Yes, we've, we've been through this in other testimony. It's brought to town meeting. The town votes down the, 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 the way through Buttrick's pasture. It then passes over the, uh, the way running to the east, presumably uh, because it's moot, but for whatever reason, it doesn't act on it. We never see it again. Um, and after that vote, as we know, uh, the, the, it's appealed to the county and we get the, the layout in question. Okay, Dr. Donahue, I just brought up exhibit 15 which mm. is a March 15th, 1763 town meeting um, okay. record. Have what you seen this, this, this King and Turing? Exhibit, I'm sorry, I'm talking so fast, Your Honor. I apologize. Exhibit 15. Okay. Dr. Donahue, is this the, the town meeting vote you were referring to? I believe it is, if we can find the right portion of it. Let's put where the town will accept of the way laid out by the selectmen. So there it is from Nathaniel Taylor Jr., et cetera, et cetera. Uh, whoop, thank you. You can see. And is there anything else that was significant in this town meeting record? Uh, jumped around there. So it, it, that one passed in the negative. And as I was saying earlier, the other way by Zacchaeus Green uh, was not acted upon. Oh yes, and then the question was put whether Joseph Taylor and Zacchaeus Green should be freed from paying any town rates for the, uh, whatever that word is, town rates for the, can't read that one. If anyone wants to help me, they're welcome to. And it passed in the negative. So you see here we have an immediate juxtaposition of where the, a couple ways are voted down or one is passed in the negative. Uh, and then this, some of the same petitioners are asking, um, well, then could you uh, release us from paying our town rates uh, since we're not getting away and it's voted down. And how does that juxtaposition, as you said, inform your opinion in this case? Well, it simply repeats the, the, the what we've been putting forward that these things are intimately interrelated. Okay. Let's, um, before we move on to the 1763 county layout itself, Your Honor, or Dr. Donahue, I wanna look at some other layouts. So I'm now showing you what's been marked as contested exhibit R. Okay. And I suggest you maybe want to look in your book as well, Dr. Donahue, okay. because sometimes it's hard to focus on the screen in the same to, way. Yes. Dr. Donahue, do you recognize this document? I do. And... Um, what do you understand this document to be? It's a layout uh, of a way in the town of Concord that is voted and accepted in 1743. It's in another part of town. And Dr. Donahue, did this document inform your opinion in this case? It did. And how? Objection, well, Your Honor. Once again, the relevance, this is not a way even in the North Quarter. It's near Sudbury, Acton is mentioned. Are you going to have you're to on. foundation, Ms. King? Yep. Um, you're... Dr. Donahue, I'm going to turn you to the second page. Mm -hmm. Do you see the line that begins, and the above named Deacon Samuel Miles? Yes, I do. 
Could you continue to read that section all yes. to the end? Yes. And the above name, Deacon Samuel Miles, William Wheeler, Jr., Samuel Dakin, and Joseph Haywood being personally present, respectively gave their lands included in said way uh, for the use above said, only reserving to themselves, I love this part, uh, and their successors, the wood and timber that shall grow in uh, said way forever. Did that passage inform your opinion in this case? It does. How does it inform your opinion in this case? It's an example of the kinds of provisions that we see uh, in this case and in other cases of petitions and granting of ways by the town of Concord of, of how land is to be given or how landowners are to be compensated uh, in the course of laying out these ways. Objection, Your Honor, motion to strike. Um, Once again, relevant. Motion is allowed to the extent that it referred to anything other than this document. Um, okay. okay. And um, Dr. Donahue, have you observed other layouts in the town records where individuals give their lands for the road through their through their own give their land for the road that is being laid out yes i have and um in this document is there anything that you deem to be um aligning with the colonial norms for how one would give their land for those roads um objection your honor i'm not sure i understood the question no. <clears throat> well, with reference to what you just mentioned, that this is this again is, I see that here the the uh, town meeting has voted this through. Um, if, if the lands uh, uh, are, um, let's read it again here. They gave them. They gave their lands included in said way. So uh, I have looked at many of these, um, both petitions for ways and also at the town meeting action on them. And as we see here, many times it's the case that the people petitioning for the way uh, give the land for the way. Okay. Dr. Donahue, I'm now gonna move you to what's, oh, I'm sorry, I moved to admit this document. Any objection, Mr. Bad? Uh, once again, renew relevance uh, objection, Your Honor. Your Honor, if I. Yeah. Several rules. Maybe Mark, exhibit 132. Okay, Dr. Donahue, I'm now going to bring up what's exhibit 116. It, this was previously, I believe, exhibit you and your contested binder book, if you want to look at it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, what number was that, Ms. King? It's, it's um, Exhibit 116. It was previously Exhibit U, if you wanted to, to view it in your binders, Your Honor. Thank you. Dr. Donahue, do you recognize this document? I do. Can you um, describe what you understand it to be, please? Uh, this is another layout for a road. Uh, by the town in 1746. Uh, this one we, we saw before, I believe, during Mr. Venosi's testimony. Uh, it's now, if not identical to, very close to Hugh Cargill Road. I think we have agreement on that. And uh, so it, it's a way that runs from Groton Road uh, up to uh, some land owned by a man named Thomas Davis. And um, I just want to clarify for the record, the top of this document on the first page has an entry that says February 22nd, 1726. Is that the date of this document? No, and that can cause some confusion last time. It, it apparently re refers to what was on the previous page. And how did this document inform, and, and Dr. Donahue, um, how would you refer to this layout? Would I refer to it? I'm sorry. Um, do you know what this lay, what road this layout was for? 
Yes, I believe it's not today called Hugh Cargill Road. Objection, Your Honor. He has not the qualifications to put this layout located on the ground today. Sustained. Your Honor, this is already an agreed to fact that this is Hugh Cargill. The town's expert testified as such. Your Honor, that may be, but this expert is not qualified to testify about that fact. Okay. Uh, whether we call it Hugh Cargill or not, it's not necessarily relevant to the okay. analysis. Um, how did this layout inform your analysis in this case, Dr. Donahue? Well, it, it gives some more examples of uh, the way land is given and um, the, the way other landowners are compensated. Can and you second, uh, direct us specifically to what you're referring to, please? Yes, at the, at the end of it, uh, towards the end of it. After, On the second after, page. Yes, after the layout is described, uh, there's a, um, we likewise order that John Brown pay three pounds and then uh, Thomas Brown two pounds and Joseph Davis two pounds, five shillings, Thomas Davis two pounds, 15. And then it specifies of which six is to be paid to Abishay Brown three pounds and five shillings to Don Hunt and uh, John Flagg gets one pound. And if you read through the, the uh, layout of the road, these are the, the names of the people that the road crosses, except for Thomas uh, Davis, who's the, who's the person that the road reaches. It doesn't actually run on his land. So what is the significance of that uh, payment to your analysis? The significance is that there's, they've agreed in doing the layout that some of the landowners who get the greatest benefit are going to pay, uh, not only give of their own land, but they're actually going to pay. Uh, and that money is going to go to some of the other own landowners, the ones who are closer to Groton Road, or who have had more of their land crossed, so they've been inconvenienced by having a new road put on their land and, or, or um, or an existing road made into an open way, uh, they're gonna be paid. And this way, there are no payments required by the town. And um, Dr. Donahue, uh, looking at this layout, is there anything else that you deem relevant to your analysis in this case? Yes, there is. And what is that? That it doesn't reach Buttrick's pasture. Um, I'm gonna bring back up or let's look up um, exhibit 52. Now, Dr. Donahue, you have stated that you believe this to be Hugh Cargill Road. What is the basis for your understanding that this is Hugh Cargill? Uh, previous testimony in this case, among other things, but also uh, the description of the lots that it crosses that um, include some of the names of uh, the people in the division of the 20 score and the a, a roadway away appointed by the proprietors of the 20 score in this general location. Okay, um, so Dr. Donahue, I'll stop you there because we're going to get to that later in the testimony. Uh, but um, you said you've relied on prior testimony. Is there anything else in this document that locates in your mind as an environmental historian where that this corresponds with Hugh Cargill Road? The general call of it running up the hill, I suppose, at the beginning. Is that? I'm sorry. I mean, I, I didn't think there was any dispute about this being Hugh Cargill Road. Um, Fair enough. Moving on. So, Dr. Donahue, as the as this way is described, and you can reference the map in front of us, mm -hmm. Exhibit 52. Uh -huh. Is there anything significant about this road as it relates to the road at issue? Yes. And what is that? Well, again, uh, the, the 1763 layout, the first alternative runs southwest across through Jonathan Buttrick's pasture, pasture and then uh, it says it connects to a road that was already laid out. Here we have the layout of that particular road 15 years earlier, and there's a gap. That, the road is laid out in 1740. Six coming from Groton Road does not actually reach Buttrick's pasture. 
that seems significant to me. Now, um, and why is that significant to you, Dr. Donahue? It seems significant in that when the layout was made first by the town, which has the same language, and then by the county court, it says that the layout runs to a lay, it runs to the end of Buttrick's pasture and connects to a, a, a way that was already laid out, but it wasn't. But they were sloppy enough or unclear in their own minds uh, as to whether that had been laid out yet or not. I don't know. We, I mean, okay, we well, there's... let's get, we'll get, to, I think we'll get yeah. to the 1763 layout in a little, in a, a little bit. So uh, I, I will come back to that. Um, I want to bring up now exhibit III. Is that going to come up on the screen? It is. Oh, okay. Dr. Donahue, do you recognize this document? I do. And um, what do you understand this document to be? It is, uh, it's an acknowledgement by a surveyor that he's a viewed a place where a, a way, I believe it's probably Monument Street, doesn't matter, uh, has been adjusted. And there's a, he has measured that adjustment and, and he's specifying a, a, a compensation that's to be paid for the landowner. And and then there's, there's a receipt at the bottom that Mr. Brown has been paid. That's actually a payment to the surveyor. But up yeah. above, you see. So, um, Dr. Donahue, first, I see that there are Buttricks and Browns in this document. There are. Is that significant in terms of where this road is placed? Well, of course it is, but this is not our road. That's not the point. These, these men own land in, in different parts of town. And can you bring that down so I can see? Sorry. Um, and um, is there any, what, was there anything in this document you deem significant to your analysis? Yes. And what is that? That this is land Mr. Ephraim Buttrick has sold to the town as an addition to the highway near John Buttrick's. So then we get a measurement of it and we get a calculation of what uh, Ephraim Brown is to be paid, which is 12 shillings, six pence. Now, Dr. Donahue. Thank you, Your Honor, to this exhibit. It, it, once again, relevance, uh, as Dr. Donahue has stated, it has nothing to do with, as far as he can tell, with uh, the road in question. Uh, it's merely another record of activities in the town. Ms. King. Your Honor, I believe I heard Ms. Um, Allison argue yesterday, while I disagree with the proposition, that she believes it is defendant's burden to prove that the condition of the 1763 conditional county layout was not met. Your Honor, Dr. Don, he was an expert who has reviewed significant town records, and he is showing you examples of what you would expect to see in terms of payment for land by a private individual, payment for land by a town, or the gift of land as attested to by the individual giving the land. This is as you will see, Your Honor, we're laying the foundation for Dr. Donahue to testify as to what he deems to be the colonial norms for having roads laid over your land and what he would expect to see in town records regarding those. Okay. Why don't you put it back on the screen for a minute? What, what contested number was this? Your Honor, I offer this was a contested exhibit III. It may be marked exhibit 132. 133. I'm sorry, 133. Now, Dr. Donahue, we have reviewed, you can take it down, um, two layouts and the last exhibit, exhibit 133. Um, you've reviewed numerous town records. Uh, as an expert in colonial conquered land use who has reviewed these numerous layouts and town records from these periods, what would you generally expect to see in regards to landowners affected by a layout? Objection, Your Honor, and once again, calls for speculation. You may testify. I would generally 
expect to see uh, some specification of who is of who's going to be paying or giving land and who's going to be paid with the default position being that the town is going to have to pay. So in many of these layouts that we see, there are specifications similar to these. The details vary from one to the next as to uh, which of the petitioners are going to at least give their land, whether or not they're going to compensate other landowners who are not among the petitioners. Um, it, it, again, it, it varies from case to case, but in general, we see that kind of, uh, those, those kinds of provisions spelled out in these, in these layouts. Um. Your Honor, I'm about to move on to the 1763 layout itself, but can we take a brief recess? Sure, we'll take uh, five minutes. We'll be back at, uh, it's 12.07. Why don't we be back at 12.15, okay? Great, thank you.
Okay, Ms. King, ready to continue? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Donahue, we're now going to bring up Exhibit 18. He scrolled in the trans yep. transcription. Dr. Donahue, do you recognize this document? Yes. And um, Dr. Donahue, um, this is the December 13, 1763 conditional county layout. Do you have an opinion as a professional historian as to what, if anything, this 1763 county layout establishes? Uh, no. And why not? 
because it just seems to me that there are confounding elements in it that make it impossible for me to reach a conclusion as to what exactly is established as a result of this. And what are some of those confounding elements in this document? And if you know what, Dr. Donahue, why don't, because I know it's hard to direct Vanessa to scroll the page. Why don't you also open your exhibit book to exhibit 18? Oh, I see, I'm on the wrong one. Excuse me a minute here. Okay. Well, I mean, the, here are the examples. The principal one is what we were just discussing. At the end, when the county accepts both returns, so uh, both of the two layouts, uh, they make a, they do make the provision that this is on condition that the said petitioners give the land for the road. Now, we don't know exactly who the petitioners are, but this is, again, as we've seen in some of the previous town layouts within the town of Concord, not an unexpected thing that the town would, would want to have the petitioners uh, give land rather than happen to pay for it. So they, they, they managed to get that, that condition in here. Uh, but then, and this is the part that confounds me, uh, there's no provision made in this for the other landowners. And when you say other landowners, who are you referring to? Well, you know, the, the, the odds that Jonathan Buttrick would be one of the petitioners is very close to zero. Uh, and why do you say that? Your Honor, um, objection, that's speculation. Well, I'm going to let him explain himself. Go ahead. I didn't think that was probably even. Uh, why, is, yeah. why uh, Dr. Ron, he wait for me to ask the question, please. So mm -hmm. um, why do you think there's little probability that a landowner such as Jonathan Buttrick would have been a petitioner for this? Because the 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 the. the Proposed layout, the one that, the, the, that this was in response to, the one that the town had turned down previously and that was appealed to the court, as we know, cut right across Jonathan Buttrick's pasture. Okay, and so let's pause there that, for a second. Yes. Vanessa, could you scroll up to the first page? Right. Please. Um, so when you say the first way, mm -hmm. what exactly are you referring to? That, that one, that was the one that had gone to town meeting in November, been turned down. And when you say that one, uh, for the record, can you um, articulate what we're looking at? What we're looking at, which runs down, you know, to a, a few more sentences, just before they start speaking of the, the uh, new way that they've discovered. Can you read the part you're referring to, Dr. Donahue? Yes, it's it's at the end, and you know we've we've come down this road before with Mr. Venosi. So, uh, but finally at the end we get to the oak tree on the east side of Poplar Hill, White Oak and Ephraim Minot's lands. We're crossing Minot through the gap in Ephraim Minot's fence. So we've arrived at Jonathan Buttrick's pasture, and so in the old road under the hill through said Buttrick's pasture to a way already laid out. That was the okay. So. So what does that provision, as you just said, mean to you as you read it in this 1763 layout as a whole? Well, in, in terms of what we were just discussing, this is, this is going to be a great inconvenience to, to Mr. Buttrick. There, as we have been told, there's an old way that goes there that people have been using it's a, as it was anciently trod or however they phrase it, but it's not an open way it just crosses his land and you have to take down bars at the end or whatever it may be. If this way goes across his land as, a, as an open way, uh, there's gonna be new fences. He's, his land is gonna be cut in half. He's gonna lose some land. And so uh, 
you know, he, he, he is the type of landowner who tends to be compensated for um, in, in a case like this. Okay, so stepping back, you said that there was a prior iteration of the layout. I'm gonna call it layout one for purposes of this document in, in the town? Right, yeah, we, we skipped, yeah, we looked at that. It was the one where the selectmen had recommended two ways. One was this one. The second one was one that ran east from this one up at Edward Brown's across Sackius Green over to Bloods and that was passed over. That was appealed to the county. The so county, that was voted down by the town. That was voted down by the town, this very thing that we're looking at. Okay, so how does that, Dr. Donahue, when I scroll to the second page, inform your opinion that it's highly unlikely that Jonathan Buttrick would have been a petitioner for this road? Well, again, he's, he's one who's being injured. Uh, but furthermore, when they, when they move, and we've scrolled a little too far, when, they, when the, the people laying out the road say, you know, aha, we've got another, in viewing they described road, the said committee discover, discovered a way that will be more advantageous to the petitioners, Oh, to all parties, the description, and then they give this other one. And they say, uh, and let, I'm sorry, and less detrimental to private property. And so, so what is less, the significance of that phrase in your analysis? Well, that would be a reference to those landowners um, who are going to have a a, a new way laid out, so an open way with fences and so forth, what we're talking about here, crossing their land, who are going to lose more from that than they'll gain in benefit from having So, so Dr. Donahue, now going back down to the condition that you read, mm -hmm. which reads, um, on condition that said petitioners give the land for the mm -hmm. road through their own land and on no other. Why is that confounding in light of what you just discussed? Well, again, because that part of what I would expect to see in the laying out of the way is not addressed. The part about the petitioners giving their land is addressed. The part about compensating other landowners, and there may have been others besides Buttrick, uh, who have had this, particularly the alternative, which you know runs south and it is the one that came into being, it crosses John Brown and David Brown. I mean, there, there's no provision made here as to who is going to compensate them. And it just, it strikes me that in a, something that's been batted back and forth and discontentious over the past few years, that a layout would be done without addressing those conditions. And I, I have no good explanation for it. I just find it very confounding. Are there other aspects of this layout that you find confounding? Well, we started to mention one before, uh, and that is that the, the first alternative, the one that the town had voted down with, a very, with the same layout, it, it says it goes you know, through Buttrick's pasture to a way already laid out, which I think we have general agreement is, is Hugh Cargill Road, that's been stated earlier. But as we saw in the layout of Hugh Cargill Road, it wasn't laid out as far as Buttrick's pasture. It stopped short. So why is that confounding? Well, it's again, just confounding that they would be so fast and loose. I, I, I might phrase it in their description of where this is going. There's no calls after Buttrick's pasture on Thomas Davis who, or whoever owned that land there. Um, it just objection, Your Honor. No foundation as to who the owners of the land were, where Buttrick's pastures boundaries were, any of the calls to owners here, and we question, uh, as we've said before, the qualifications and foundations for Dr. Donahue to express this opinion. Dr. Donahue, if you could keep your answers a little briefer, I think we might be able to hurdle. Okay. Um, so. Uh, why, uh, I'm sorry, could you read the sentence again where it connects to what you believe is Hugh Cargill Road or it refers to? Mm -hmm. uh, into 
Jonathan Buttrick's pasture and so in the old road under the hill through said Buttrick's pasture to a way already laid out. Okay. And what about that sentence is confounding? As I say that it says it connects to a way already laid out. Okay. And what is your understanding as to the existence of a way already laid out in the location as described in that layout? And when I say that lay, I mean layout one of exhibit mm -hmm. 18. That it appears to connect as I think everyone up to now had agreed uh, to what is now known as Hugh Cargill Road. I, I'm gonna interrupt there because Dr. Donahue has now stated three or four times that everybody agrees. Yeah, I, that that I agree, Your Honor. Hugh Car that the way referred to in that first layout was Hugh Cargill Road. I recall no such agreement. Ah. Case. All right. Dr. Donahue, I just remind let's not you. Characterize, let's not yeah. characterize I'm others' sorry. testimonies. I'm sorry. Totally understood, Your Honor. Dr. Donahue, <laughs> why do you believe, and please let me know if you'd like me to bring up the map, that the way referred to, again, could you show me where the language is, Vanessa, please? Oh, right there. Mm -hmm. um, said Buttrick's pasture to a way already laid out. Why do you, Dr. Donahue, believe that that refers to Hugh Cargill, which was the layout which had been ex already ex entered into evidence as exhibit 116? Objection, Your Honor. I restate what I had previously objected to, to Dr. Donahue's testimony on Hugh Cargill. And it's location. I didn't object when he said everybody agreed that it was Hugh Cargill's road. I, I uh, agree, Your Honor. I, I passed by that. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, Your Honor, if I may, you you can let him try and explain why he thinks that, that the re reference to the connection to the existing way is Hugh Cargill's road. You have to lay a foundation. Dr. Donahue, would it be helpful if we go back to the layout of Hugh Car of what we what you believe to be Hugh Cargill, or are you would you like to just explain to the court why you believe that to be Hugh Cargill? Um, well, from a why don't we turn why don't we turn back to Exhibit One Sixteen? Okay which is um, exhibit you in your contested exhibit book. Okay, Dr. Donahue. Looking at this document, Exhibit U, or I'm sorry, Exhibit 130. I'm sorry, I apologize, Exhibit 116. Hmm. You've, we've already established that you've reviewed this document. Are there calls in this document that indicate to you that this corresponds with Hugh Cargill Road as indicated on map Exhibit 52? Well, it comes out of Groton Road. That would certainly be the first one. Um, okay, and Dr. Donahue, does that reference to Groton Road correlate to anything today that locates Groton Road? Yes, I mean, Low Road today it would be called. Um, and you know what, why don't we take this down? Let me go back to the 1763 layout, which is exhibit 18. If the way already laid out 
refers to what you understand to be Hugh Cargill Road. Why do you find that confounding? Calls for speculations, hypothetical, Your Honor. Your Honor, he's an expert. I'll allow, he's it. I'll allow it. And he's already testified to it at least a yeah. couple of times. And I understood his testimony to be that he thought that the way referred to as Hugh Cargill Road, which I don't know has been established in any way, but that because Hugh Cargill Road didn't reach Jonathan Buttrick's pasture, um, then it didn't make any sense. So I get it. Can we move on? Yes, I think you got it, Your Honor. Let's um, move on. And, and Dr. Donahue, we don't know who the petitioners for the 1763 County layout were, correct? We know a couple of them and others. Do we know a couple of them and others? Do we not? I'm sorry. We... Well, have you ever seen the petition for the 1763 no, County no, layout? No, I haven't seen the petition. I thought it was perhaps referred to either in the town's layout of it, uh, town meeting or... Well, the I, I, I take your point. So in the document itself. The 1762 layout. Um, the first line, are you looking at it, Dr. Donahue? Uh, which, uh, which exhibit is it again? Exhibit 18. This. Right there, yes. right? Uh, there we go. Is this what you're referring to as how you might know who some of the petitioners are? Yes, no, this is the petition to the court. So it's not the specific petition for the road itself. Uh, that was from, as I recall, Zacchaeus Green and perhaps Joseph Taylor. We have to go back to what triggered the selectman's layout of the road. So they, they've named a couple of them, but the rest are and others. Okay. And as a historian who studied this, um, the, this time period, and especially, especially as it relates to this road and Carlisle, I'd like to bring up ex uh, Chalk O. Dr. Donahue. Um, this is again chalk O, which is overlaid onto the 1779 map, which is exhibit mm -hmm. 25. Um, what, having studied the history of these of this, these events and the various petitions, if anything, can you infer about who the petitioners would have been? And, and, and I guess I mean generally, do you know whether they would be located in certain parts of Concord as opposed to not in certain parts of Concord? In the general way, as we've seen in the other petitions, it's logical that many or most of the petitioners would have been those householders uh, that we're seeing there who are either along the road as it was laid out or, or close to that. Um, and Dr. Donahue, however you interpret the condition of the 1763 layout, mm -hmm. do you know of any evidence of town records attesting to satisfaction of that condition? I have not seen records of uh, that certify that any of those petitioners or potential petitioners or anyone uh, has given land for um, for this road, or has been paid for this road. Um, Dr. Donahue, you you testified about the conflict and tension with the Northerners at this time. Does that conflict inform your interpretation of this layout? It does. And how is that? Well, again, I think I stated this earlier in the sense that given that context. Uh, I would have expected to see more of the kind of thing that we are just discussing. A, a more careful layout, a more careful uh, specification of who's going to pay, uh, who's going to receive compensation 
and, and and so forth. But we see none of that other than the other than the condition that the petitioners uh, shall give their land. Okay, Dr. Donahue, I'd like to now move to after 1763. I'm going to bring up contested exhibit VV. VV as in Victor Victor. Dr. Donahue, do you recognize this document? I do. Why don't we wait for you to pull it up in front of you as well? Okay. Yes, let's do that. Very good. I have it. Okay. And um, what what is this document? Just briefly, if you could describe it's a petition it. Petition to the uh, selectman. It's another request for for. Just just sure. the date and. and yeah, this is a petition dated 1768, so a few years later. Okay, and did you rely on this document in your analysis? So Excuse me. Can did we you first rely establish what it is before? Yeah, he gets it's a petition of, of a road. Another, it's another rate, a petition for a layout of a road from Nathaniel Taylor Jr.'s. And what is the date of this document? 1768, so, so it's five years later. It says February 19th, 1768 at the top. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, and did you rely on this document informing your uh, analysis in this case? I did. Okay, um, and and what is the significance of this document to your analysis? Um, well, it's a, it builds apparently builds on the road we have seen. Uh, it runs north from Nathaniel Taylor Jr., who was a the north call on the 1763. Uh, layout and it goes through several other people uh, north through the center of what will become Carlisle until it reaches the uh, the Bill Ricca line, I believe. And then secondly, there's a there's actually a second request for a road there that does a similar thing that continues uh, one of the blood farm roads, I believe, uh, north. And um what, if anything, was significant about this document to your analysis? Um, well, uh, it, it demonstrates the pattern that I was speaking of earlier, that the residents of the northern part of Concord that are moving towards becoming Carlisle are, are continuing to work to build out their road system there. And then there's, there's a bit of an oddity in it uh, that the that the second one uh, specifies that it begins at an existing way. Whereas this one that presumably begins at the way we've just been talking about doesn't mention that. And is that one of these uh, conflicting pieces of evidence you've been discussing? It's a little bit confounding. Uh, so um, to it seems like the first and this is a petition, correct? Let's scroll right. down, Vanessa, so we can see who signed the petition. And Your Honor, I'd like to offer this. Mr. Bat. Uh, Your Honor, I, I, I don't think we will maintain our objection to this. Okay, maybe Mark, that would be, what can exhibit? Exhibit 134. Thank you. Um, Dr. Donahue, looking at these names, are there any names on here that inform your analysis of the conflicting nature of this document? Uh, it's many of the same cast of characters. Daniel Taylor, Timothy Wilkins, Samuel Green. Now, Nathaniel Taylor signed this document. He did. And um, go ahead. Well, the, the, the proposed way begins at his land. Um, is it odd to you that he signed a petition for a road on his land connecting to a previously laid out, uh, 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 the 1763 county layout as described? That's and it doesn't mention leading, that road? Leading question, Your Honor. Well, Sustained. Dr. Donahue, what is the significance of you seeing Nathaniel Taylor's signature, if at all, on this document? 
Well, it, it, in essence, just to repeat and um, what, what I said before that he was um, intimately involved in requesting this road. It begins at his land. Um, it's highly likely that this is the extension that continues north as the road runs today. Um, and so its purpose would have been to connect to that road that we've just been discussing. And that's not mentioned again, whereas in the second, there's another road mentioned in this that does say it begins at a townway. Okay. Dr. Donahue, I'd like to bring up contested exhibit B, 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 four Bs. All right. Um, Dr. Donahue, do you recognize this document? This one? Oh. Yep. I do, yes. Can you identify what this appears to be? Do we have a date on this? I, I believe it's 1776. We're in our foundation objection. So it hasn't been offered yet, and I think Ms. King is trying to lay a foundation. Okay. Um, Dr. Donahue, putting aside the date, mm -hmm. did you consider this document in your analysis I did. of the 1763 county layout? Mm -hmm. And what about this document, if anything, did you deem to be significant? Oh, hold on, I want to read it. Oh. Would you like me to read it, Your Honor? If you like, I can read it. Um, to the selectmen of the town of Concord. He says Okay, I've, I've read it, you can uh, inquire about it. Um, Dr. Donahue, what um, does this document, what is the significance of this document to your analysis? Uh, this is a, um, a, a request for a town meeting article by Hugh Smith, who is one of the calls along the way in the 1763, um, layout as it proceeds south from Nathaniel um, Taylor's. And we know he has a house in that area, although I don't believe that layout actually calls his house, but he's up there. And what he seems to be saying is that, um, that he, he is claiming that he never agreed to give land uh, for the road that was laid out some years before. I'm sorry we don't have a date. I believe this is in 1776. Um, and he's, he's well, sort of challenging the, the someone to come up with, the, he's saying there were eight men present when they claim I made, I made this promise to give land. If they can find two of them uh, who will swear that I said that, then, uh, then he'll pay back what he was given and he'll also pay for swearing those men. So Dr. Donahue, why is this confusing? Well, we have someone here who claims he, he uh, it, it gets to that condition that the, the land be given. And here's a, here's a fellow who claims that he never made any such promise. And since we don't know who all the petitioners are, that's what we know. Okay, and I'd like to, bring, um, Your Honor, I'd like to offer this and as to the date, I think the next document will inform the date of this. Uh, we continue to have our objection to this, Your Honor, as, as to relevance. Let me, let me get something straight. Hugh Smith, his land is along the 1763 layout as 
as it was adopted or is he on the yes. part that was changed? He's on as the second layout, your honor. Oh, and the first. And the first, the, that's correct. The Thank same you, in the north. Right. So he's north of Citrix or whatever his name was. Buttrick. Cut Buttrick's land. He, he is one of those who owns who has a house and owns property in what became Carlisle. And the, I think the second call or second or third call in the, in the way coming south from Nathaniel Taylor's house uh, goes through Hugh Smith's land Okay. in 1763. And it, it's the same, of course, in both of, uh, of them because it doesn't deviate till we get to Buttrick's pasture. All right. Um... It may be marked as Exhibit 135. Um, well, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I could not hear you. What exhibit did you mark that as? 135. Thank you. So, um, Brian, or Dr. Donahue, I'd now like to show you what has been marked as contested exhibit DDDD, as in dog, 4Ds. I've, I've got it, I'm here. Okay. Um, do you recognize this document, Dr. I Donahue? Do. I and do. um, <clears throat> could you please identify it for the record? Uh, it's town meeting minutes from a Concord town meeting of uh, May the 14th, 1776. And what is your understanding as to the, what is happening on this document? Well, the eighth article on the warrant that's acted on refers to this petition of Hugh Smith that we have just seen, the undated one. It says, uh, to hear the request of Mr. Hugh Smith respecting his promise of giving the land contained in the road by his house, the town laid out some time past, so actually 13 years past, and act thereon if thought proper. So this is the warrant for the town meeting. Okay. And if we scroll down further, Dr. Donahue, does that inform, keep, keep going, inform what happened to the warrant for the town meeting? Oh, do we have a vote coming up here somewhere? I'm sorry, I've been looking in my book. Oh, yes, the eighth article. On the eighth article, voted to uh, postpone the consideration till next town meeting. And, and I Dr. should say, go ahead. Dr. Donahue. Do you know if a vote was ever taken on Mr. Peti Mr. Smith's petition? I don't believe that one has been discovered. I know of no such vote. Okay, I offer this. Um, Mr. Bad, any objection? Well, Your Honor, I object to this one. Um, I, I think the previous one, we did not establish that this road is the same as the 1763 layout that Mr. Hugh, Hugh Smith is petitioning about. And so this is just uh, one more lack of foundation as to the relevance of this. I, I, when I asked, I thought you didn't disagree that Hugh Smith's house was one of the calls in the northern part of the 1760s. I don't think we heard that. We heard that Hugh Smith was on the petition and Hugh Smith's land. No, we only know that Zacchaeus Green was on the petition I, I'm sorry, Your Honor, you're, you're right about the petition to the county. Um, Your like, Honor. Wait, hold on. I, and, and it, I don't want to back, go back and look at it, but Hugh Smith was one of the calls south of Nathaniel Taylor's house on the 1763 layout, right? It, it, it's 13 years later, Your Honor. Um, and we don't know, the, we've heard of other petitions, your layouts. Uh, so we can't correlate this one with necessarily the 1763 petition or layout, I should say. Uh, I'm going to allow it to be marked, maybe exhibit 136. Yes. Um, Dr. Donahue, I'd now like to bring up on the screen. Exhibit 25. Exhibit 25. Oh. Ah, yes. So, um, 
We're going to get to the substance of this map in a second, but Dr. Donahue, do you understand what the genesis for this map was? This map was uh, part of the back and forth with the state legislature in 1779, uh, the petitions and then uh, subsequent action that resulted in the town of Carlisle being finally established in 1780. Okay. Now, Dr. Donahue, I'd like to bring up contested exhibit T, 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 Tom, 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 Tom. Oh, okay. Um, and uh, you can turn to that in your book as well, because it is a long document, so it might be hard to, to scroll. Right here. Okay. Are you with me? I've got the document. Okay. Can you identify what this document is? Well, this is part of the back and forth that uh, I was referring to as the legislature. I'd like to have not a conclusion. I want a description, I'm sorry. Doctor, of what so, this uh, Dr. Donahue, I think the date. Uh, and to who it is to and from is all I need for the answer of that question. It's a, from a committee in the in the in Concord Acton and Chelmsford. So in the proposed town of Carlisle, it's sent to the legislature. Uh, and if you can help me find the date, uh, yes. March if you turn 24th, to the last page, yep. March twenty fourth, seventeen eighty. Um, Your Honor, I move that this be omitted. Hold on a second. And, and I'm sorry, Ms. King, what is this? It's a petition to the, to the state legislature? This is the petition that correlates to the 1779 map that you just saw as Exhibit 25. This also is a petition regarding the separation of Carlisle that was ultimately ratified and is why we have Carlisle today instead of the Northern District of Concord. Mr. Bad, any objection? No objections, Your Honor. All right, it may be Exhibit 137, 137. Now, Dr. Donahue, I know this is a, a long document, but while we're on this page um, and you observe the signatures, are there is there anything significant to your analysis about the signatures on this page? Well, simply that some of them are the same players, so we're at the end of a 25-year saga since, uh, or 26 or whatever, since, since uh, 1754. And this committee includes Timothy Wilkins, correct? Right, right. How does Sorry. Timothy Wilkins connect to the proposed, seven, the 1763 conditional county layout? Um, I don't, he was a landowner further north than Nathaniel Taylor, and we don't know the petitioners, so he was on some earlier petitions. But I believe we just looked at a petition for a road. Right. Objection, right, so your honor, leading. I'm sorry. And... That's fine, Your Honor, I'll move on. Um, can you find the major reference in this document? Dr. Donahue, does this document inform your interpretation of the 1779 map that has been marked as Exhibit 25? Yes, it does. And how does it inform your analysis of that map? Let's bring that map up. Well, so, and I still have the uh, <coughs> petition open, and uh, I don't know if you want me to read from it. It's on the second page. Okay. It says the pricked line upon our plan that is in the line proposed by the town of Concord was not marked out to show our willingness that it should be allowed. 
uh, but the unreasonableness of Concord to desire it, as it will take off so large a tract of land and a great deal of it belonging to the petitioners, and to let your honors see that it will run up within a mile and a quarter of our meeting house, which is there in the center of the plan. Um, so if this should be granted, I mean, I, I could go on. They're, they're no, I, that's that? fine. Okay. Um, so Dr. Donahue, having read this petition and looking at this map, Exhibit 25, mm -hmm. are you able to conclude what the dotted lines inside um, this map, as I now see on the right, bottom corner are? Well, there's two of them. Yes. But other than that, it certainly appears that that's what's being referred to in the petition that it correlates to, to the prick line on the plan is what the town of Concord is being, is proposing be excluded from Carlisle as it's being established. And how do you interpret the petition in terms of their reaction to those proposed boundaries? Well, they're protesting it because they're saying they're going to lose too much land. They're going to lose some of the very petitioners who wanted to break off. So it's, that's the gist of it. And um, if do you, do you, Vanessa, could you rotate this so he can orient himself as to the legend at the bottom, please? Mm -hmm. Dr. Donahue, can you tell from this document who prepared this document, this map? Uh, the plan contains the tract of land petitioners petitioned for by the same, by some of the inhabitants of the town of Concord, though Rickachelms were enacted, and to be set off as a town or district uh, containing, and it gives a number of acres in uh, November 1779, and then it's by Isaac Foster Surveyor, okay. and it gives the scale. Now um, let's reorient this map to so the south. So Dr. Donahue, just generally, given the petition um, and this map, what is the purpose of this map? It's to show the proposed district of Carlisle and the people residing within it, the petitioners. And uh, it also references their, uh, the, the corner uh, where Concord has a different idea of where the, the um, line ought to run. Um, so in this 17th, so um, the context provided by the petition, does that inform to you whether there was contention regarding, regarding what is actually the southern half of this map? Objection, yep. Your Honor. This calls for speculation. Once again, we're way far away from the 1763 layout, both in terms of time and in terms of the theme of this questioning. This thing. Dr. Donahue, this map occurred after the 1763 conditional county layout in 1779. Can you show me where the, ro the road as laid out in 1763 appears on this map? Exhibit 25. Well, yes, we've used this map before uh, to trace its route south from Nathaniel Taylor's and by Hugh Smith. Is someone. But do you, does, is the road annotated as appearing on this map, well, Dr. Donahue? I'm, I'm saying that the, the layout then tells us that it should go from Hugh Smith and just west of Zacchaeus Green and go down, hit the Concord line about there where that line bends and where someone has written Captain, uh, Captain Green's pasture. Uh, and let's, bring up, let's bring up for reference um, Chalk O, which has some annotations that might make seeing those names a little clearer. You know what, let's, let's not because it's one o'clock. Okay. I would like to point out that it's kind of ironic that those two towns ended up sharing a high school anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many history projects have been done on this friction. <laughs> well, they get along better now. Um, okay, we'll resume at, uh, let's make it 10 after two, okay? Thank, Thank you, you, Your Honor. Honor.